<laughs> Who knows what this is? Good guess. Looks like a piston, doesn't it? This is a core out of the Marcellus shale. This is a piece of Marcellus shale. This thing is full of gas, right? You pass that around, feel how heavy this thing is. That's, we call that source rock. That means that's not just the back, back in the old days, when people looked for oil and gas, they were looking for little pockets of oil or gas that had seeped up through various geological layers and hit a cap rock. And there, it was relatively limited quantities. And so you could drill a pipe down, and it would hit that. And you'd suck it up, but then you could drop another pipe 30 feet away, and you'd hit nothing at all. Um, and one of the things that occurred in uh, the early 2000s and that has continued throughout um, the rest of the 21st century as we know it is um, an ability to access that kind of rock, that source rock, where they drill down and then they put in tons of chemicals and water and pressure and they crack it in a process, a process called fracking. Um, and then they're able to drill horizontally through the source rock. So you can drill through the same hole 360 degrees all the way out, right? And you can, you can go for miles underneath. So even areas that would be inaccessible before are now accessible. Um, and so those, those two things represent two of the largest energy resources for the United States right now. Shale gas, um, just to give you a sense, was uh, just even 10 years ago was a minuscule proportion of the amount of uh, gas that we use, natural gas that we use uh, on a national basis. It now accounts for nearly half um, of our natural gas production and usage. Um, so it's a huge change. What else are these things beyond energy resources? Let's think um, uh, conceptually. How might we imagine these things? Organic matter. Old organic matter. Yeah, that's exactly kind of where I'm going with it. Yeah, great. I guess they make the same thing as solidified sunlight. Oh, yeah, yeah, solidified sunlight, we're getting there. I think of them as time machines, right? Because by using that coal, by putting a match underneath that coal, you need more than a match, but you get the idea. I, I hop into my H.G. Wells time machine, and I go way back in time, and I find a dinosaur, and I bring it forward in time, and I murder it. <laughs> of course, when we talk about fossil fuels, we're not really talking about dinosaurs most of the time. We're talking about plant matter, right? But it's a much better metaphor. Um, and so what we're really doing when we burn fossil fuels, in a sense, right, is we're engaging in the first part of a temporal disconnection, right? That is where the temporal disconnection that we're going to talk about today in energy policy has its first iteration, right? Its first piece is us going back into the ground and finding carbon that was in the atmosphere or that was in the carbon system hundreds of millions of years ago and then re-releasing that carbon into our present system, right? And that's what creates all the trouble, right? If we just burned carbon and it was carbon that was already part of the carbon cycle, no big deal. You're not really adding to the concentrations, but the fact that we're pulling carbon from the past and bringing it into the future, right? Um, it's like... Uh, was it, was it Ghostbusters 2, I think, you know, where uh, the great Vigo is brought from, from the past to cause problems in present-day New York? It's kind of like that, but not really. <laughs> so let's, um, while you're passing that around, um, just get a, get a look at it. Um, I want to spend most of our time in the first part of the class today on uh, the Scrace and Aquil piece, which is just extraordinarily rich. Um, and... Uh, and unpack that a little bit so that we can essentially work to get on the same kind of discursive page, um, which is, of course, what they're talking about, right? Building common languages and common discourse. And this is hard to do. Um, so we'll be spending some time with this. Um, we will briefly cover some of the concepts in Eliot, although um, Eliot is, is a much less dense text, obviously. Um, and then we'll talk a bit, hopefully before the break, um, about uh, uh, Scottish farmers and their resistance to uh, energy crop growing, which is pretty fascinating. Um, in the second part of the class, um, we can talk a bit about discount rates, and I also we're going to do a virtual guest lecture um, from uh, Professor Philip Allen, uh, who is an incredible um, jurisprudence expert at Cambridge. Um, we're going to be watching a video of him giving a lecture uh, on YouTube, and uh, I know that would sound boring, but Alec is just incredible, and we'll be able to talk about that uh, a bit later. But this first part of the course 
or, or the class rather, is going to set up our discussion for what Alan is going to talk about, which is really about how do we conceptualize the international space that's different from the domestic space, and how do we deal with that difference in scale, um, and how do we think about what kinds of actions are possible, right? Because that's what that's what Grace and Apple are kind of talking about, right? Is how do we, how do our existing conceptions and frames temporally, geospatially, linguistically, metaphorically define and constrain what we think is possible um, and what we think is pragmatic um, and what we think will play with other people? And it's not to say that anything can happen or that uh, uh, anything is possible. There are lots of things that are. Um, but we should be aware of the unconscious uh, tendency to, to, to frame our solutions within ways that don't necessarily um, give us a full view of reality. Now, of course, in doing that, we're not going to get out of frames. There's no escaping discourse, right? Discourse is, is embedded. And we'll even see some examples here in Straits and Aquil that are actually kind of amusing because we can see them accusing others of framing things improperly, and then they'll do the, next, the, the very same thing in the next paragraph, and that's not a dig against them. We all do that. Yes? Can I just check if the mic is... Oh, yes. The mic is on. Can you hear me now? Should I move it up? I'll, I'll try it up here. How's that? Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah. OK. Don't worry, those in distance, you didn't miss anything important. It's just a bad one. <laughs> um, a couple housekeeping items uh, before we get started with comments, um, and that's that uh, a few distance folks have noted that uh, the, uh, the mics are set too low, and so it's hard to hear student comments. So um, we're upping those mics today, but um, in-class students try to speak up um, whenever you're talking. And I know that seems a little uncomfortable, but um, you know I'm a little deaf too, thanks to growing up in the 90s. Um, so uh, it'll help me as well. So just be loud when you talk. Um, we'll try to fix it technically as well. Um, we should also have an additional camera feed that should make this easier to see. Um, for those of you at distance, I know that this, this screen was not ideal in terms of um, uh, in terms of, of uh, resolution last time. So we're, we're trying to fix that right now. Um, we will be having uh, next week a guest speaker, uh, Professor Darren Tuhi, um, who is uh, here as a professor of uh, atmospheric science. Uh, will be coming to talk to us about, um, not about atmospheric science necessarily, but about the Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, he was there, uh, he was deeply involved, uh, and he will give us kind of the scientist's perspective on climate policy following our own discussion of um, uh, disconnections in climate and energy policy. So we're gonna talk about broad scale disconnections today, kind of on the temporal scale and on the linguistic scale. And then we're gonna talk specifically next week about how energy and climate policies tend to talk past each other, and Darren will help us understand that. I will also hand out the uh, project and paper assignment next week, um, so that'll be available as well. It's not too late to start thinking about that. It's a very open-ended kind of thing. This is grad school. You all have your own interests. I'm not gonna try to constrain you unnecessarily. Um, so if you have interests in a particular area and a particular technology and a particular kind of development, start talking with your classmates now about that to identify who you might want to work with or whom you might want to work with. Um, I think that's it. Any questions, any difficulties accessing material that I should be aware of? Um, Ali brought up to me that uh, there is a mess, a, a mess going on with the final exam scheduling. Somehow the registrar's office has uh, made a mistake in um, scheduling some of its final exam times. Uh, and I am going to get to the bottom of that this week and figure out what's going on with it. Um, I wouldn't worry too much for this class, but uh, many of you may be affected by it. But uh, Shannon Simpson and I are going to figure out what went wrong there. Um, it's, these things happen. We'll, we'll get it fixed. Um, I'm probably going to have both exams in this class be take-home exams, uh, where you'll be able to collaborate with your peers on them, because uh, I know a number of you are going to be out of town that week anyway. Uh, and this class kind of lends itself to more of a contemplative model rather than having to memorize a bunch of stuff and then spit it back out. Um, so we will likely be doing that unless I see a compelling reason to do it otherwise. Any questions on that? Papers? Finals? All right. Let's, uh, let's jump in. So um, we talk in Scrace and Ockwell about linguistic framing and a discourse perspective.
And linguistic framing is kind of a, it's a fancy way of saying how we use not just words, but images, right? So words and images. to construct narratives and stories. And the reason that's so important is that narratives and stories are the ways in which we, we think, they're the ways in which we argue. Um, you can notice it in any classroom in the world. If you start telling a story about Greek mythology, everybody pays attention right away much more so than they do if you start talking about the fourth assessment report of the IPCC. And that's because as human beings, even though we have a highly developed slow brain that we're working on making knowledgeable and exact and analytical and precise, um, we still have a very different part of our brains that evolved as part of the human experience, right? And that, that part is driven to story. It's driven to meaning. And um, this, this narratives and stories thing it really informs an enormous amount um, of the ways in which we make energy and climate policy. And so um, a lot of what Strace and Ockwell are trying to explain in their article are uh, kind of ways in which that occurs. Um, and the first big thing that we see uh, in Strace and Ockwell is this idea of a socio-technical system. And this seems like something that we should understand intuitively, but it gets hard to define exactly what is and is not a, a socio-technical system when we start thinking about it. So let's think about um, let's think about something simple to start: a lamp. Socio-technical system. Just a technical system, right? But, but look, I'm interacting with it. That makes it socio-technical, right? You can move it up and down. You can turn it on and off. Fancy, right? Why is that not a socio-technical system? Yeah. Can it not comprise all of society or a large portion of it? So it's just me, right? It's it's a pretty simple interaction, right? Yeah. So what right now we are doing? See, we have internet and we are having students who are not here. So that's I think social technical system. Oh yes, jumping right into the hard stuff, right? So it's a it's a combination of these social and technical aspects in ways that interact with one another and produce what we might call complexity. Right? So this, this is not a complex system, right? There's only so many things I can do with it. I can raise it up, I can turn it on, I can turn it off, I can put things underneath it. Um, and moreover, nothing that I do is going to change this thing, right? This thing is an artifact. It's an object. It does a very limited number of things. And nothing that I say or think about it is going to change what it does or how it evolves over time. Now, the classroom system that we've got, the camera system, right, is a bit more complicated. How might, how might we conceptualize that or perhaps argue that it is in some ways socio-technical? watching it and they're learning something, so, and they're interacting too, so isn't that social? Is it? Good question. Yeah. Well, I mean, they made comments that the mics weren't loud enough, so we changed the system to accommodate. Yeah, and that's, I think that's the essence of what makes something begin to be socio-technical. It's not just that people are interacting over, right? Um, a telephone line by itself is not necessarily socio-technical. This system, as it exists right now in this moment, is not necessarily socio-technical. But the ways in which we are changing it from week to week is a socio-technical system, right? There's a temporal aspect, and we make changes to it according to what people need. Still a relatively simple socio-technical system, I would, I would think, though. What about a car? Is a car a socio-technical system? Yes. Yes, why? It started out very simple, and as people wanted more comforts and more safety and more features, they continuously developed and improved it. So we have like seat belts and airbags and yeah. air conditioning and power steering, 500 horsepower sports cars that don't possibly need. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. <laughs> I'd say one of the just technical side too is the social aspect of like sitting on the freeway in traffic. Mm -hmm. 
How, how else have cars, so right, it's not the car that's the, that's the socio-technical system. The car is just a technical system. But when we interact with it, what sorts of interesting things start happening here? I think like cars kind of interact with um, like class and opportunities and things like that. Uh -huh. You don't have a car, you can't get a job 50 miles away. Yeah, kind of thing. yeah, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, like, the, um, the feelings that a car could give you, like, when you're driving on an open road with, like, open windows and your music playing, like, that right. can affect how you feel. Sure. Yeah. Um, I think, like, with the fact that we build whole cities around cars. Yeah. That's a huge aspect yeah. of it. So, right, we got what happened in the 1960s in, in cities, right? White flight. Who said white flight? Talk, tell us about white flight. Um, a lot of white people got scared of the fact that people that were not white were um, moving into the cities and they moved out to try to um, establish better schools, what they thought of as better schools for their white kids in the suburbs. Sure, right? And that was enabled by the automobile, right? The automobile forms this part of this social and technical system. Now, one of the errors in, in technology thinking is believing that the technology is the critical factor, right? Did cars create white flight, we might ask? They made suburbs possible. They made suburbs possible, right? They're an enabling factor, but they require another element, right? And then what happens as people move further and further away to the cars that we built? Just build more roads. We've got to build more roads. The cars themselves start to change, right? Initially, they become more comfortable. And then as commutes get even longer, they have to deal more with efficiency, right? And then they're affected by what other sorts of things? Yeah, the cost of the fuel, gasoline. Yeah, Jerry, the cost of the fuel, the gasoline, right? Suddenly our socio-technical system now includes a geopolitical system, right? About resources and about politics and about war, right? And all of these things start to get kind of layered on top of one another, right? So a car, not a socio-technical system, but automobile culture is a socio-technical system, right? What about how might we characterize, say, the electricity grid as a socio-technical system? What about it makes it socio-technical? Yeah, okay. There needs to be balancing of load and supply at all times to make sure the system is able to function properly. So demand by all the end users like us using the lights in this room versus the power that's coming in from wind turbines or you know a coal power plant has to be, both those things have to match mm -hmm. to work properly. What else? Yeah. I mean, without electricity, nothing can go. So people are depending on it, and there is interaction all the time. Right. We have other systems that depend on electricity, right? And that defines you know, where we go and when we go. Yeah, go ahead. Well, it enables. Um, I guess what's more, a modern human right, which is access to energy mm -hmm. and all the economic and social activity that come with that. Access to energy, right? right. One, One of our, our major, major, major themes, themes that, that we, we deal, deal with in the reading. reading. Yeah, correct. Um, the availability or the price of energy determines energy's power is like work, so what mm -hmm. you can actually do with it. Like, mm -hmm. You can build a city in the middle of the desert if, you, if energy is cheap enough, you can desalinize ocean water and help you make something right. like that. Las Vegas is possible, right, because of the electricity system. Right. Well, see what I I was going to kind of build in on that. It facilitates our lifestyle. You can stay up late and turn the lights on. Mm -hmm. You can fly across the country and all these other things beyond the electricity grid at that point. Sure, sure. You require the grid to be able to go. Sure. I mean, imagine it. As if, imagine if you were somebody coming to the Chicago World's Fair at the turn of the century, right? Uh, the Chicago World Fair was held in, I think it was, was it 1903? I think it was 1903. Maybe it was 1897. Um, there's a great book about it um, called uh, The Devil in the White City. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend it on your reading list alongside Virgil. Um, and uh, a lot of people who went to the Chicago World Fair had never seen electric light before. Right? They lived in farmlands. And they came to Chicago, and in the middle of Chicago is what they called the White City. And it was White City because it was lit by incandescent light bulbs all over it. Massive, massive buildings. I mean, the, 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 it was the size of this campus easily. You can imagine strolling into that, that thing that had been constructed in a year. I mean, the buildings, enormous halls of technology, 
all constructed in a year. And as you were to walk through there, coming from the farmland, having never seen electric light, you see all of this, like it's, it's energy, right? Harness there, visible, right? It'd be like stepping onto the bridge of the Starship Enterprise. <laughs> and, and that changes your conception in an instant of what's possible, right? That's, that's the essence of a socio-technical system, right? Is that it doesn't just, it doesn't just involve people interacting with it. It itself changes how people interact, right? And there's this continual reformation between the social and the technical. That's what defines a socio-technical system. We'll come back up against this again and again and again, especially in not. Yes, Thor. Uh, but then I don't quite understand, because why did you say that that lamp you have over there wasn't a social-technical system? Because, as you just said, the lamp and uh, the, the fact you're able to light things up has, has, changed, the, uh, has changed the humans. So the, the lamp itself here, right, this object is just a technical system, right? Light bulbs, broadly conceptualized, are a form of a socio-technical system, right? And it's, the, it's, it's shifting your thinking away from the object and toward the, so, the society's interaction with the object that we use when we think about socio-technical systems. Yeah, go ahead. Well, wouldn't, uh... Then all uh, like uh, kind of uh, invention be social technical because all inventions has a greater purpose than just uh, the, the 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 thing itself. Like all has a purpose to uh, transform um, something. In some sense, all social interaction with technology form socio technical systems of some kind and a very complexity. But you have to distinguish the interaction from the object. Right, there are two different things. Right. Not really, but they're two different things, right? Because if we just start thinking about objects, our socio-technical system becomes a technologically deterministic system. What do I mean when I say technologically deterministic? The technology that's there determines the outcome. Yeah, right. To the social interaction determining the outcome. Yeah, right. Um, this this happens all the time. We'll see. Not uh, David and David and I will talk about this when we read Consuming Power, right? Um, even in the 1960s, a lot of scholars uh, would explain how things like um, uh, washing machines uh, changed, the, uh, changed the development of women's work at the time, right? It, it, it increased uh, the expectations of clothing cleanliness. Now, that by itself isn't a wrong statement necessarily, but the way that we phrase it says a lot about how we think about the relationship between technology and people. What do I mean by that? Anybody get, see what I'm getting at? The washing machine changed women's work. Yeah. Anna, what, what's the woman? Right. What's weird about saying that? Yeah. Well, it's just weird because it's like expect. It's like the whole general thing. Like you expect that, like women, women. It's women's work. I don't know. Sure. Yeah. 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 That's, That's right. 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 Yeah. You can just say it changed people lives rather than just saying women. It kind of puts women in a frame like they are supposed to do this. This is their task. That's how it goes. Did it, it's, it's, but it's yeah, a one, that's, but the, basically, that's saying it is a one way interaction without that loop. It goes back. It yeah. says, oh, well, there was a desire or a need or something that, that allowed this system to, and other systems that didn't allow the washing machine to be created. So it's not just, oh, we have the advent of this technology, poof, you know. And then here's what it does to to people. It yeah. kind of takes it out of that, that feedback loop between the social and the technical. Right. It, goes both ways. Right. it, it <laughs> presumes, this is exactly right, right? It presumes that there is something about this technology that is that that, that is itself driving progress, right? It, it is a force of progress on its own, right? And we can think about this in the renewable energy context in all sorts of ways, right? What's the most common technological deterministic way that we think about renewables? Technology improves and then it gets adopted. Yeah. It becomes better. Right? We just we just need it to be cheaper or better, and then it will drive change automatically, right? The, the classic example is uh, the price of solar photovoltaics, right? Solar PV has come down in price precipitously since the 1970s, right? It's now close to a dollar a watt to produce, three dollars a watt to install um, on a home. That's incredibly low. Um, and there's a presumption among Many people that work on solar technologies, as well as the general public, 
that once solar is cheap enough, there's nothing left to do. Right? You don't need any more policy. Right? You see this all the time on Facebook. Right? If you follow, um, if you follow renewable energy sites, you see two things: uh, articles about solar roads. God help us. Um, all over the place. We'll have a whole class about why I hate solar roads, but that's later on down the road. Um, and the other is X technology, wind, solar, whatever, at parity with fossil fueled resources. What's the presumption that the average reader gets out of that? That he will only care about the dollar signs and nothing else. Yeah. And that what people are thinking about, which is a whole scale transformation of the system, is going to be effectuated by having solar and coal at the same price. What's wrong with that argument? Yeah, great. Uh, there are lots of other considerations that go into the whole the infrastructure of an energy system. Sure. Just like, for example, uh, they didn't get the signatures needed for the two ballot measures that were going up on uh, November. They were both uh, fossil fuel and gas related, but yeah. one of them was a 2,500 foot setback to fracking from any building. Like, yeah, yeah. But you need space for solar panels too. And even, I have to imagine there's some, we study this stuff, there are arguments against like every kind of alternative energy. So sure. They build solar panels in environmentally sensitive areas. So you can't put solar panels in the desert, you'll build a cacti. It's a rare right. cacti. Right. Turtles so generally. Like, yeah. Can't, can't desert tortoises are a major concern. You live near a windmill. You know, yeah. they even had um, some of the reflective solar stuff people don't like because birds fly in the path. It's a giant mirror, and all of a sudden, it's got a poof! Vaporized. If you haven't seen it, uh, trigger warning <laughs> if you don't like birds. Uh, but yeah, I mean, they just die. They're vaporized by these towers, right? Um, and of course, that's a big part of it, right? An additional part of it is the fact that we have existing infrastructures, right? What do we need in order to transmit all of this electricity that we produce by solar panels or by coal plants? Cables, new transmission lines, right? Where are all of the existing transmission lines? Yeah, they all go to coal plants, right? Which, where are coal plants? Right. Wherever it is economically efficient to build them, which says close enough to the mouth of the coal mine and far enough away from the city where people are going to complain about the emissions, right? So the whole system has this socio-technical aspect. As it evolves, people's choices are framed by the technologies, and people's choices frame the technologies, right? Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And so understanding that interplay is really important. Now I'm kind of kicking a dead horse here, um, trigger warning. Um, but I'm going to do that because I'm a jerk. Um, uh, if we can't laugh at ourselves, uh, someone should be laughing at us. It's the old one. Um, OK, so we've talked a bit about about socio-technical systems now. We understand interaction as a critical piece. Now let's talk about complexity. Complexity is something we talk about all the time, but we don't always know how to describe it or how to define it. What is complexity? Right? Any guesses? Many parts. Say again? Many parts. Many parts. OK. We've got many parts. So let's think about a coal plant. How's a coal plant work? Burn coal. Burn coal. All right, so we got coal. Coal. And you get to see my terrible drawings. It's burning. It looks like a mistletoe, doesn't it? All right, it's, it's burning. Right? What is it? What is it? What happens? What happens to this heat? Heats water. Whoa. All right. Heats the water, right? And the water becomes steam, right? What does that steam do? Power is a turbine. Power is a turbine, right? This is all tremendously oversimplified, of course. Right? That makes a turbine spin. Right? And then that turbine is hooked up to a dynamo, right? And that dynamo is just like the alternator in your car, right? That's how we get our charge, right? Now, is this complex within the meaning of that term in the discourse? Sure, it is. Thor? Yeah, yeah. actually, to make it work, like, yeah, take, like, uh, I've taken 
uh, thousands of hours like to figure out uh -huh. Uh -huh. how to put it also like maybe the coal is shipped from the, the other part of the world and, um, and the technology for the uh, generator is maybe like hundreds of years old development and yeah, so I would say it was complex. Complex, complex or complicated? John? Well, I mean, it sounds like what Thor is talking about, maybe it's, it's difficult. Yeah. It has a lot of parts. It's difficult. And it's at a certain level, it's like, you know, you, you may have, have problems you have to solve. But on a larger scale, it's something that's, that's generally well understood. It's not, a, it's not a thing that has many parts that interact in ways that, that can't be on a basic level predicted. Right. You know, the coal plant... We don't, we don't need a master engineer at the coal plant every day to make sure it doesn't blow up, right? You have to have people design it. It's complicated. But what do we mean when we talk about something that's complex? Coal plants, it's complicated. It's big. But complexity is different, right? Complexity, if you have to look at the inputs and the outputs from a coal plant to see how complex it is, so the geopolitical environment that got the coal to where it needs to be, and then technological infrastructure aspect of distributing that generated electricity out to the people who need it. And then complexity, I think, really comes into play when you try to make changes to that system or when changes are forced upon that system. Mm -hmm. So if your supply line changes based on whatever's going on in the world, and then same thing with the output, if people no longer want to use coal-powered electricity because of the environmental factor, that's going to make the system complex as well. We're, We're getting really close, close here. here. That was good. What's, what's, the, what's, the, what's the fundamental system? aspect of a complex system? Yeah. It, yeah. it can be changed in addition to creating change, right? I mean, it yeah, can be right? acted upon as well as acted upon. Yeah, it's, it's, it's got this interactivity aspect to it, right? Often socio-technical systems exhibit complexity. Well, it's cyclical. So feedback. <laughs> feedback loops. That's it. Yeah. Now... Feedback loops are really interesting. Tell us about feedback loops. What is, what is a feedback loop? Uh, positive or negative feedback. You can think of a guitar amplifier. When you hold a guitar in front of an amplification system, and it gets that really, really loud noise because you have little sounds that are going in, and then the amplifiers are coming back out and going back and forth. As opposed to negative feedback, which encourages stability because you're detracting from the input. Yeah, yeah, right. So until like the 1970s, People didn't really think about positive feedbacks. It wasn't really believed that positive feedbacks were a big deal. They were kind of anomalous, right? And in the 1970s, a group of scientists um, from all different disciplines, actually, one of the early interdisciplinary approaches um, that was at a, a place called the Santa Fe Institute, started studying positive feedback loops, not just as, as oddities within the system, but as kind of fundamental organizing principles of the universe in a lot of ways, right? And they apply it to our society as well. So an example of a negative feedback loop, let's think about a, a, a standard negative feedback loop. We use these in economics all the time. We know about diminishing marginal resources? Yeah. Well, it's just like an air conditioning unit. Like, um, it has a sensor in it, so when you turn it on, you want to like maintain room temperature at a certain, I don't know, like 72 degrees. As the room heats up, the machine itself will reduce what's happening in the room. Yeah, and so negative feedbacks encourage a return to equilibrium, right? I just remind everybody, try to talk loud if you can. Uh, I know it's uncomfortable. Um, but, right, it's, it's, as, as, our, as our, our set temperature approaches um, its set point, the system works less and less, and we return to an equilibrium, right? And the understanding really based on this, so the mythology that we are operating under when we think about negative feedback loops is the notion of a steady state, right? The notion of a, an equilibrium to which things return, right? But the group in Santa Fe started working on positive feedback loops, right? So instead of the air conditioner or the classic one they use in economics is uh, hamburgers, right? If I eat a hamburger, I am less likely to eat a second hamburger. Not, not impossible, right? I might eat a second hamburger, but then I'm even less likely to eat a third hamburger, um, right? And so there's a negative feedback effect, right? As I eat more, I get more full, I eat less. But a positive feedback loop can occur as well. And in a complex system, positive feedback is a, de is a defining characteristic. So let's take some examples. Um, classic examples, um, these all come from uh, an Irish economist named, uh, named uh, uh, Brian Arthur, um, who 
first realized this with respect to two things that he wrote papers about in the early 80s. Clocks was the first, and keyboards were the second. Now, the presumption when we think about a clock, right, and we ask, why is a clock the way it is? Why does a clock have 12 hours? Why does it have two or three hands? Why is it in a circle? The answer that most people had when Brian Archer was researching this was, can you guess? What do you think? That's the way it is. Why is it that way? It's efficient, right? That's the engineering approach, right? It's efficient. It's that way because people tried lots of other ways, and clearly this was the way that worked best, right? It's the free market at work, right? But Brian Arthur didn't believe that, and he went looking for all sorts of different clock designs. So he went back and he started looking at um, different clock designs at the origin of mechanistic clocks, right? When, when the British first started designing clocks, what were all of the various examples? And what he found was that efficiency was not what had defined the 12 hour clock, there were many more efficient forms. I, you know, the military, for example, uses a 24 hour clock. Is a 24 hour clock more efficient than a 12 hour clock? Yes, why? Because it's our entire day. Yeah, you don't need additional information. AM, PM, don't need it, right? It's a much more elegant solution. And yet we don't use the 24 hour clock in daily life. Well, I guess the Europeans do now. Sometimes. We don't use it here. We should. The moral argument, I like it. Right? <laughs> so what he did find was that the positive feedback occurred at a very specific time, and it's because clocks were part of an emerging industry, and an emerging industry that was extremely sensitive to initial conditions, right? Sensitivity to initial conditions. What does that mean? Let's think about it. It's just like how we preconceive the world. First time you meet somebody, you initially just think something about them. Mm -hmm. So that's going to weigh on how you think about them until they prove you that. Yeah. What else? Action. Change it. <clears throat> Little changes in those initial conditions have major impacts as opposed, as opposed to something that is not sensitive to it. Or yeah. The it's, it's biased towards the initial conditions. It doesn't evolve as conditions change. Yeah. It's seen in evolution of the genetic drift. If you have a bottleneck in the population, the future generations are based entirely on the genetics of the survivors. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's where we're going, going, right? So for whatever reason, back when people first started buying lots of clocks and we started using clocks, right? Itself a function of industrial society, right? The reason we needed clocks was because we had factories. And people needed to be there on time. And they had to know when they started work and when they stopped work and when they got a lunch break, right? No one really needed clocks when we all did agricultural work. You just went by the sun, right? All part of a complex system. But for whatever reason, the 12 hour clock had a few more people buy it than all the other clocks, right? For whatever reason, it was just a bit more popular. Maybe the person who built the 12 hour clock had a bit more capital to work with, and so they got more models out. And as people became familiar with the 12 hour clock, it became what in their mind? Thor? How it was supposed to be, I mean, and then they like yeah. just yeah. kept that. It creates an illusion of naturalness, right? The 12 hour clock is natural to us that grew up with it, right? We think of it as a natural thing and we justify it according to mythologies about its inherent efficiency. We do this for all sorts of things, right? Not just clocks. What about keyboards? Can you guess? Here, you guys know this story, right? Yeah, in the back. So I, I think they were designed, uh, actually it's based on a typewriter keyboard yeah. where the keys that are most frequently used had to be separated so they wouldn't jam. Yeah, right? Uh, the typewriter keyboard was designed specifically to be inefficient, right? <laughs> Why do we still use it if it's so inefficient? Because it's really hard to retrain yourself. Yeah. I sure as hell wouldn't want to have to relearn the type. Maybe the speaking like traumatized me as a child. <laughs> Car is slowing down. <laughs> You'll remember. 
right? So the QWERTY keyboard, another example, right? Keyboards evolved in that way because typewriters had this peculiarity about them, right? They had to be slowed down. And so as typists got more used to them, the keyboards that would evolve after that problem was long gone would define their development, right? And we see exactly the same thing happening in the energy system, right? We have all of these initial conditions that led to particular market conditions that we now take as natural, that we now take as normal, right? It's normal to have baseload electricity. Why? Why do we think of it as normal to have baseload electricity? Oh, good question. Sorry. Breaking my own rules here. So baseload electricity means power plants that run 24-7 at a constant output, right? So a coal plant, a nuclear plant, they all run pretty much like this, right? Flat out. So if you try to move a coal plant up or down, it doesn't do so well. Um, it doesn't adapt to change very well, right? So if you compare this to a natural gas turbine, which can be moved up and down very easily at set point can change very rapidly. Big difference in efficiency. Likewise, of course, wind and solar have output that is dependent upon resource availability. But we think of baseload, again, you'll see this if you get on social media or the internet, the general public is very concerned about the idea of baseload renewables, right? How do renewables provide baseload? If we can just do that, then renewables will be market effective and cause a massive transformation. But the very notion of why we need baseload electricity itself is baked into our ideas about what's normal, right? How do we get that? Thor? Because we have never like, been used to anything else, and it's, like, it's very comfortable to always have access to electricity. Very comfortable, right? We like having access to electricity that we can turn on and off, and yet, do we have to give that up if we don't have baseload generators, necessarily? No, why not? Yeah, why don't, why don't we have to give it up? Are you going at me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just not shaking my head. That's okay. <laughs> Take a guess. Think it out. You're all very smart people. I just think that if we have enough solutions um, in various forms that we don't need baseload because we have enough at our disposal. There's, a, there's kind of a complex balancing, or rather a complicated balancing that can occur, right? Why? Why does, why does it not matter? I mean, it seems counterintuitive to us, right? Surely you need baseload running. What if I need electricity and there's not any on the system? Yeah, right. Batteries replace baseload generation? Batteries would be a means of trying to basically take a wind farm, right, and fill in these gaps, right? So battery technology is itself essentially, uh, it's, it's a product of this very shibboleth, right? It's a product of the idea that we need renewables to provide baseload. Yeah. I mean, if we can manage turning things on and off and ramping up and down, none of them have to be constant as long as the sum equals the demand. Right, because demand is variable, right? Demand is not a baseload, right? What's a demand curve look like? Yeah, right? The duck curve, it goes here and off, right? So. We part of the morning, it ramps up. This is about 10 a.m. here. As all the AC kicks in, we get to the top. There's a big hump here where we hit the hottest part of the day, and then it slopes off at the end of the day, right? That's your demand curve. And of course, if you look at this at a, a small scale like that, right, this little section is going to look like this, right? It just averages out to that. Right, so our conception of the need for baseload is, is based, it's not to say we don't necessarily need baseload, right? It's to say that our conception of how much we need baseload is based on some rather unexamined assumptions, isn't it? Right? Let's see. Ooh, another good one. Light bulbs, right? If, you, if, if you've spent any time on, uh, on, on the internet, and I'm sure none of you have, but in case you have, um, you may have noticed there's this really, really interesting social movement among people that are really upset about incandescent light bulbs being phased out. You notice this? Is it the dark sky one? Uh, the dark sky initiative? The dar uh, I know, no, no, it's not, it's not dark sky, although I, I, I'm a bit. Are you calling me about? 
friend, like at my old work, I would have people calling me about that, and I'm like, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that that is itself a very interesting development. Um, I was, wasn't one I was thinking of. But there, there's a whole group of people um, on, on the internet, or rather, in, they are real people, of course, they just happen to communicate over the internet, um, who are very, very upset about the Department of Energy's new energy efficiency standards that are phasing out incandescent light bulbs, right? Um, what, what are some reasons why you think people might be upset about that? Is it the change in shape? Energy security? Change in shape, energy security, I like it have this perception that you can only get this sort of incandescent light quality, like the yellowy glow from an incandescent bulb, even though they design LEDs to make that same light quality. Yeah, and, and why do we want that? Why do we want that glow? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we're used to that glow. Yeah, right? Right? On lighted streets on quiet nights, right? For those of you that are rush fans. Right? It reminds us of something, yeah. I don't want anyone telling me what type of light bulb to buy. Oh, yeah, right? <laughs> right? There's also this kind of American notion like, F you, specialist guy, I'm going to buy whatever the hell light bulb I want. <laughs> right? And that, that's, that's an element of it as well, right? Um, do we want incandescent light bulbs because they're more efficient? Well, no, right? They're terribly inefficient, right? But there's, there's something about them that's deeply rooted in our psyche, right? We remember them as kids. They were, make homes feel like home, right? And we can make fun of people who don't like giving up their incandescent light bulbs, but that's not going to get you very far in social change, right? People don't tend to take kindly to having their, their core beliefs and values attacked, right? I was in, um, I was in New York City this weekend, and uh, there was a billboard... Uh, for, uh, for veganism, right? And it said, uh, uh, go vegan uh, because it's the fair choice, right? They had like a, like, a, like a baby space of like, you value your life, right? And it's kind of like, well, who are you really gonna convince with that, right? Like, hey, you meat eater, you're a jerk. <laughs> and you're incredibly unfair and unethical. Consider my message that I'm going to give you about how to change your eating habits. <laughs> Sandwich just <laughs> yeah, your initial reaction is, is to kind of bristle against it, right? There's a lot of that going on when we try to change energy systems, right? We are, we are stuck in this, the, the, the technologies themselves exhibit positive feedback. Our reactions to the technologies exhibit positive feedback, right? The harder people try to get us to switch away from things with which we are comfortable, the more we tend to buck the trend, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because we want to hold on to something that we have been grown up with, and accepting something new, even though it is more efficient, it is difficult. The same with the bulbs, and same with this baseline, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. base load electricity. Right. So, same goes even to the renewable energy as well. It's socio technical and also socio cultural. Yeah. 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 So one of the ways in which energy policy people have tried to get around this problem is by trying to reframe energy problems in ways that speak to those kinds of core concerns. Right? So we talk about this with um, uh, the construction of energy problems. Right? We call this framing. The basic idea behind framing is that how you set up the argument that you're trying to make has an enormous impact on people's likeliness of adopting whatever it is you're saying or what you want them to do. That it's not enough for a solution just to be efficient, for a solution just to be technologically feasible or cheap or profitable. It has to fit within our existing preconceptions, and it has to fit within the narratives that we tell ourselves, right? We have to construct a reality. And I think it's is it on this page. See if I can find it. Yeah, on page uh, 2226, uh, near the bottom of the page on the first panel, right? We call this the discourse perspective. This draws on political scientists' observations of ways in which politics and policy making proceed through the use of language and the expression of values and the assumptions therein. Discourse can be understood 
as a shared way of apprehending the world. Embedded in language, it enables subscribers to interpret bits of information and put them together into coherent stories or accounts. Each discourse rests on assumptions, judgments, and contentions that provide the basic terms for analysis, debates, agreements, and disagreements. So one of the ways that we tried to reframe energy um, back in the latter part of the 20th century was around energy services, and this is still something we're trying to do today. Right? Initially, what was the, the original way that we thought about energy from our readings last week? What was the dominant narrative of energy policy? <laughs> Energy as a commodity, specifically energy supply, right? When we talk about commodities, we're worried about the supply of energy. And I mean, this hits right at, right at our baseload notion, right? When we think about baseload, the very things in the mind that construct the desire for baseload electricity are these normalized structures involving the security of energy supply. Why? Why was energy supply so important? What are, the, what are the initial conditions that were so important in the development of that positive feedback loop? The oil embargo? The oil embargo, even before then, right? That, that uh, it exposed just how dependent on it we were. But what created it? The Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution, and it's, we're right in between. So the Industrial Revolution was really important, but that was driven primarily by coal. When did oil start becoming important? Cars, good guess. World War II, a little further back. World War I, and it got important in World War II, right, as well. Why? What happened between World War I and World War II? The British Navy switched from coal to oil for ships. Yeah, the British Navy, right? The British Navy switched to oil from its ships, and that was when energy supply became inextricably linked with global security. Right, safety and security, right? And we still operate under this today. It's still a very powerful narrative. That hasn't changed. But in our attempts to think about how to, how to shift the energy system toward greater, um, greater efficiencies, there's been an attempt to reframe energy policy in terms of energy services. What are energy services? The simple answer can be provided by Amory Lovins um, of the Rocky Mountain Institute, very famous energy thinker, uh, to which she said, uh, electricity and natural gas are the carriers of energy. Energy services are what people actually consume. People don't consume kilowatt hours or, um, uh, or BTUs. They consume cold beer and hot showers. <laughs> Or the opposite, if you're British. <laughs> I think that was Joel who said that, yeah. All right, so energy services, you can always remember as hot showers and cold beer. So this includes things, you can think more broadly, Instead of thinking, how do we make sure we have all the energy supplies we will ever need to meet all of our needs, we ask, how do we provide warmth, lighting, what else? Refrigeration. Movement. Yeah, mobility. What's the other big one today? Internet. Yeah, let's say communication or connectivity. And this allows us to think differently about how we might conceptualize how to affect that system, right? And the, the, the advantage that Amory Lovins uh, figured out that nobody else had quite seen was that when you start working on this side, of the energy system, you start getting benefits that you don't get when you work over on this side, right? Namely that if I need a power plant, right, and then I need a transmission system, right, and then I need a distribution system, oh, and let's just start up here and say I need a coal mine. How do I make a mine? Look, it's a hole in a mountain, right? There we go. Got a coal mine, right? Let's think about all the efficiencies that we, that, that we need here, right? So I get coal out of the ground. 
What sorts of energy am I wasting when I dig coal out of the ground? What do we need to get coal out of the ground? Do I just go in there with a pickaxe? Oil, need lights, machines. Oil, right? I need machines driven by diesel, right? I need lights. I need people. I need all these things, right? And so the energy content of the coal that comes out of that mine is only a small amount of what's going into it, right? Engineers think of this in terms of energy return on energy invested, right? The amount of energy you have to put into a coal mine to get that coal out, right? You have much more that goes in. Likewise, when we burn that coal in the power plant, how much of that gets converted into electricity? 30, 30, 30. Yeah, 30 to 40%, depending on what kind of technology that you're using, right? The rest of it, why, why can't we get better efficiencies out of that? Yeah, right, it's called the Carnot limit, right? The Carnot limit says basically when you're, when you're working with something like a coal plant that runs a ranking cycle, right, where you're, you're boiling a fluid and then you're using the heat from that fluid to turn, to, to boil something else and then to turn something, a lot of your energy gets lost to heat and there's really no way to recapture it. You can attempt to recapture it through combined heat and power and then use the heat in other ways that are useful, but the engine itself is limited, right? So we lose a bunch of energy here, we lose a bunch of energy here. We go to transmission lines. What are transmission line losses? Five percent. Yeah, five to seven percent, depending on the age of your transmission system and, and, and your distances. And then more at the distribution level. Now, if I want to start, this is Amory Levin's core point that he made uh, in his first book, right? If I want to start reducing the inefficiency of this system, what if I want to reduce emissions from this system, where do I start? Do I start here, or do I start here, and why? Yeah. Well, you start on the right side. You start with the energy services, because if you reduce the amount of energy that you're using there, you avoid all the emissions upstream. Exactly. Right? When I save a kilowatt hour of electricity over here, I'm not just saving a kilowatt hour here. Right? I'm saving that kilowatt hour plus 7% that was lost in transmission, plus another 60% that was lost to efficiency, plus all the savings of not having to dig that little piece of coal out of the ground in the first place, right? So the, the, the benefits stack backwards, right? That was the insight that, that Levin's had about the, the beauty of energy efficiency, right? This was all at a time when um, there was a big kind of uh, uh, alternative thinking movement uh, uh, led by E.F. Schumacher called Small is Beautiful, right? The idea that we didn't need to live bigger and bigger lives. And this, this seems somewhat intuitive to us today, natural, right? It seems natural to us today. But if you think about the way that people lived in the 50s and 60s, gigantic cars, gigantic houses, the notion of a worthwhile life was tied to having lots of big things, right? To having an energy intensive lifestyle. And that started to change at the time. And of course, if you travel anywhere and like, if you go visit relatives in Houston, for example, you'll see that this is still very much alive, right? I have many, I, 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 I have a lot of friends and friends and family in Dallas, Texas. And I mean, like they live in houses that are eight times the size of my house in Boulder. Eight times the size of my house in Boulder. The same number, I think I have more dogs than they do. <laughs> it's amazing. But it turns out it's hard to reframe these things, right? For, so, you know, Amory Levins took an engineering perspective to this kind of thing. But we found that despite the, the brilliance of this insight, it's an absolutely brilliant insight, it didn't effectuate the change that we were necessarily looking for. And Scrace and Ockwell tell us that Part of the reason for that is that it's hard to reframe things when our reframings create threats to perceived interests of powerful groups, right? Powerful groups that are linked to what he calls governmental imperatives. This is, we have to unpack the kind of nerdy academic language here. What is he talking about? What are perceived interests of powerful groups linked to governmental imperatives? So big oil, right? Another, another great shibboleth in our minds, right? We'll talk about just how complicated big oil is. But yeah, go ahead. They mentioned um, maintaining domestic order, surviving internationally as an intense state, raising revenue, and then the capitalist democracy, so for our country, would be economic growth and sustainable legitimacy. Yeah. So big oil, or 
whatever would be a huge factor in sustaining economic growth. Yeah. That's been ingrained in our country for a long time. Right. So this notion that we can just have brilliant insights and then have that affect policy outcomes without understanding the broader context in which they exist, right? Like we were talking about it just last week, right? I mean, we were talking about, well, why don't we just let the utilities fail? So what? <laughs> so what? <laughs> so what, right? There are lots of impacts, including to us and other people, of letting those things occur. And so the dominant model, what's the... What's kind of the dominant model that Grace and Ockwell are trying to fight here, right? The dominant conception of policy making as, what are the words they use? Objective and linear, right? I'll never forget this. It was my first year working um, out of law school in uh, an energy policy think tank. And... Uh, my colleague that sat in the cubicle next to me was uh, a, a, a bio conservation biologist turned electrical engineer. Um, should be close to many of your hearts who are shifting to different areas, right? And um, he's an irascible fellow. Maybe I'll get him in here. He works on biochar these days. Um, but you know, back in the day, he was really he really wanted to understand the electricity system and he really wanted to change it. And I remember um, he just, he just kind of went by in a huff. It was 3 o'clock on a Friday, and he just looked really, really upset. I said, Jonah, what's the matter? And he said, why can't we just pass the policies and fix the problem? Right? And it was such a simplistic question. And what really struck me about it was I didn't have a good answer. Well, of course we can. Why? I don't really know. Let me think about that. Nine years later, I still don't know. But here we are, right? We all go into policy thinking that policy works in a particular order, right? And Strace and Ockwell say, over here are schoolhouse rock, right? I'm, a, I'm just a bill sitting on Capitol Hill. <laughs> Gotta love your schoolhouse rock, right? We start with facts, right? We start with facts. This is, a, this, is a, the, the, this is an academic's conceit, right? That the world, that, that policy making starts with facts. Once everyone knows the facts, we'll be able to move forward, no problem, right? It's why we spend, you know, we, 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 we kill millions of trees every year trying to explain climate change to people who don't believe it. We just, if we all just agreed on the same facts, right? Then we can get to the next part. Ryan, go ahead. I was going to ask about the facts. Like, isn't that one of the problems that he brings up in the article? Yeah. The facts have been way oversimplified. Yeah, 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 right? So we've got facts as the starting point, right? And we're, we're, we're talking here about, this is the model that we're trying to debunk in the article, right? That Grace and Ockwell says, is what we all think policy making is, even if we don't know it, right? This is our unconscious initial condition for how we think policy works. And what we're trying to do is deconstruct that and say, actually, maybe that's not the way it works. Maybe we need to think differently about it. What comes after facts? Analysis. Analysis. Right, so we've got facts, and then we take those facts and we put them together, right? And magic things happen in analysis, right? It's a, it's a little black box. We put in facts, we cook them, out comes analysis, right? Those facts are condensed, and they are turned into knowledge products. We call this academia. <laughs> They go into little journals that are read by five people. That's what happens to all my articles. <laughs> Unless you're forced to read them by your professor, which is the only way we get any kind of self-satisfaction. So you'll have to read one of my articles at some point. Facts, analysis, and then what comes out of analysis? Once we've got all of these knowledge products, right? Solutions or conclusions. It's a bit like our technological determinist view, right? Facts are independent things that are analyzed and create objective truths. And those truths create solutions all by themselves. They beget solutions in the biblical sense, right? 
So, so what does Grace and Akhil have to say about this? Not true. It ain't necessarily so. Why? Why? What's missing from this model? What is it that we're not seeing? Yeah, David. Um, I think outside influence, mainly from particular interests and power centers. So maybe a, a, a political economy model, right? We need to understand power structures, right? We call this political economy. If you're not familiar with the term, you just have to break it down for a second, right? Economy, economics, right, is the study of how we allocate resources. Political means political resources, the resources of power, right? Political economy is how our instruments of power become arranged and traded among entities that possess power. Right. What else? Yeah, Malika. Um, any uncertainty that might exist in the facts we're not capturing? Yeah, uncertainty, right? So one of the criticisms here is that in order for facts to be put into the analysis hopper, they have to be chopped up into little itty bitty digestible pieces of information, right? Uncertainties, complexities, things we don't quite understand, they're, they're hard to do this with, right? It's hard to do analysis with that. Anna. Um, people have different opinions of how to solve these problems. Yeah. This one I like a lot, right? in that you can almost reverse this completely and you get an idea, some idea of how actual policy making occurs, right? <laughs> People start with whatever their ideology tells them is a solution, right? If you're a leftist, your solution is gonna involve taxation and government regulation. If you're a rightist, it's gonna involve more markets. Do I even know what the, what the question is yet? No, <laughs> right? I just know where I stand because that's part of my identity, right? I'm a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a yellow dog Democrat, so I'm gonna support policies that take these kinds of approaches, right? Because that helps me define who I am. And then I'll perform some analysis that explains why my particular ideology happens to be the right solution to this problem. And then once I'm done with this and people start attacking my analysis, I'll find some facts to support my side of the argument, right? This is exactly how argument happens on Facebook, right? <laughs> We start with a solution, and then somebody says no, and then we start posting articles to each other that neither of us either ever reads. <laughs> or you read just the first paragraph, and then you Google debunk XYZ. <laughs> we all get to be geniuses on social media. It's great. What's, what's at the core of these things, right? Uncertainty, the hiding of uncertainty, the expression of opinions, how political economy functions, what's the currency that we're working in, what's the medium that flows throughout this whole system? We're using it right now. Speech, language, yeah. That's what Grace and Ockwell say is missing, right? Language, where is it? Language expresses values and embeds assumptions, creates a shared way of apprehending the world. Right? Behind this is a debate that goes back, whoa, what's that? It goes that way, okay, good, it's gone. Behind this all is a debate about the fundamental role of language in reality. Right? This goes back to the Middle Ages, actually further, um, but uh, medieval, medieval church philosophers were kind of the ones that did the most interesting work on it. Um, uh, Saint Peter Abelard uh, being one of, the, one of the major thinkers in this space. And it has to do with nominalists, versus realist conceptions of language, right? And what we mean here, and this is not an argument that has any kind of a, uh, a definitive outcome, we still argue about this today in our own ways, right? But it has to do with whether words are the handmaiden of reality, so to speak, right? There is an objective reality. There are a set of problems that are really there, and we just use language as kind of a convenient means of 
creating agreement or sharing our opinions, or whether our perception of realities, our definition of what our problems and what they include and how we might approach them are inextricably bound up with the language that we use to describe them. Right? Thoughts? Yeah, go ahead. I was just kind of, I've heard something on a podcast somewhere where it says that different languages influence ways of thinking. Yeah, um, yeah. So like, for example, um, in the English language, people were shown a picture and the person was on a bicycle and they would just say that person is cycling. But in German, um, there was like just a nondescript building behind it and the Germans would invent what that building's purpose was and they'd say that person is cycling to the grocery store. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the takeaway was that I guess the German language has like each sentence has a purpose mm -hmm. or something like that mm -hmm. and then the English language not necessarily so yeah. and then it was sort of you know they extrapolated into saying that culture is more productive focus versus sure yeah. right that's an example of yeah of how, of how language can influence what's normal to us yeah. and I heard a really interesting one too that so there's like future, I think it's called futuristic languages. And um, so, I don't, I don't, this was a while ago. This is like an undergrad when I remember I was learning about this. But Amer like um, in American, well, English is not a futuristic language. Mm -hmm. So um, the languages that are futuristic, people like actually start thinking about the future more. So they're more likely to save more likely to participate in like healthier, less risky behavior. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they've done studies that have actually shown that. Sure, right, yeah. In Latin, there is no word for retreat. Roman, Roman soldiers could not retreat. They had to habere pedis, take back the foot. Right. Homer talks about the wine-dark sea. Nowhere in Homer is the sea described as blue or green, right? Ancient Greeks saw the sea as wine-dark, right? That was their conception, right? Just a few interesting examples of how, how important language is. Why am I blathering on about this? It's because it's to impress upon you the importance of crafting good language and good metaphors and communicating your ideas not just efficiently, but in a way that will construct a narrative that brings your readers along with you. It's really important when you do policy work. Not all of you will do policy work, but you'll be surprised, even those of you that go into engineering, uh, after about 10 years being an engineer, you'll find yourself doing way more policy than you ever thought you would. Yeah. So this is like the most ironic article ever, because they say in the beginning, we're going to break this down so it's easy to read. <laughs> I know, it's so dense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Where's, there's, there's, a, there's a great example here, right? Um, let's see. Uh, page 2227. Uh, in the second column, third paragraph down. The fact that something is discursively constructed through social interaction does not make it any less real. Law courts are very real institutions, for example. They do not simply fall out of the sky. Taking action on climate change in wealthy nations may involve passing a law forbidding expansion of airport capacity. What? It's <laughs> like the worst idea I've ever heard. Like, right? But when you're trapped within your own conception, it's hard to even think of what good climate action might work with, right? Um, this, would, this, would, this would first require a change in political values and beliefs that are currently reflected in the discourse that sees limitless flying as an individual right. Once such a new premise were established, negotiating the law and articulating the law itself, and to some extent enforcing the law within the context of court proceedings, within the context of court proceedings? <laughs> You're going to haul people off flights at the end and start, it's just wacky. Um, would all be achieved through the use of language and the expression of values, interests, and beliefs therein. The environmental and social impacts of energy use can be very real regardless of how partial or constructed people's understandings might be. Being able to heat homes and cook food adequately can be lifesavers. Conversely, the human cost and ecosystem impacts of a nuclear accident like Chernobyl cannot be wished away through a postmodern appeal to the way in which society constructs experiences of such impacts. Really? <laughs> 
isn't that exactly what they're arguing? That yes, through the way that we talk about Chernobyl, we can in fact wish away our experience of that reality, right? Don't advocates of nuclear power do that? Right? Isn't that part of the pro-nuclear argument? Is that, well, you know, Chernobyl, it was a problem, but we fixed it. And, you know, Fukushima was a fluke. No problem. Like, it's, it's, it seems interesting to me that even people who are deeply entrenched and trying to work on discourse themselves find themselves trapped in it, right? We're all trapped in discourse. Um, there's a great, uh, so one of the, the world's greatest linguists is a guy at Berkeley named George Lakoff. And um, he, does a, he, does, he does academic work, he also does political work. Um, if you're interested in his linguistics, but you're not um, an ultra leftist, you might want to go for his academic work instead of his political work. But um, he talks about, he does this great exercise where he says, try to go three sentences without using a metaphor. Everyone want to try? <laughs> what are we talking about exactly? I describe something very technical without using a metaphor. <laughs> uh, I think to express an opinion, try expressing an opinion without using a metaphor. It's really hard. Can we use a simile instead? <laughs> <laughs> Always looking for the A. <laughs> it's a way of seeing just, we don't, we don't think we use that many metaphors, right? Try it. <laughs> you are, are you striving to think of something right now? It's a metaphor, right? It's how we think about thinking, right? We think about thinking as though it's a physical activity, right? It's how we construct meaning and all sorts of things, right? And it's, it's one of those things where we, over the course of, you know, whatever degree program you're in, you'll have many opportunities to work on your writing skills. But there's a tendency, particularly within technical discourses, to presume that I've got good ideas. I'm just having trouble getting them out on paper, right? But Spray Sinatra will say that's, that's not quite accurate, right? If you, can't, if you can't put your ideas into language, they're not good ideas yet. Right? They need more work, right? The ability to write, the ability to create language is the ability fundamentally to think and to communicate effectively, right? Yeah. Just devil's advocate, aren't there just some inherent limits due to language itself? Like, I mean, Kurt Gödel's like, incompleteness theorem yeah. states that even language itself can, we run into paradox all the time with language. Yeah. And you hit semantics. And so... I mean, even the argument of free will can be broken down to the fact that the word choice cannot be really dissolved and into, or it can fit into either camp. So in, in a sense, sometimes language itself, the resolution is not there. Yeah. What a, what what a, a shitty, shitty situation, situation to find ourselves in, right? Our only tool for organizing society to save itself is language. And it's hard to construct good language, and it's ultimately impossible to construct perfect language. Right. Yeah. Well, I would say, as a counter-argument to that, that's why we use metaphors so that you get a storyline to then convey the idea of striving, which may be incredibly hard to articulate, but everyone understands what it is because we do it. Right, right. Well, and, and we're, we're breaking the spell here, right? When we analyze language and we expose metaphors, they lose their power. Right. If you ever want to ruin a book for a child, explain to them why it's a metaphor for their development. Right? <laughs> if, you try, if you try to you know, tell your niece that where the wild things are is really about her coming of age, right? completely either lost or if she gets it, the story isn't magic anymore. Right? There's a hiding that occurs. Right? You have to be able to hide within. And that's what makes really good metaphors, right? Not metaphors that beat you over the head, right? It's why calling somebody a Nazi on the internet is the worst possible way to argue with them, right? Not just because you're a jerk for calling someone a Nazi, but because it's the bluntest metaphor you could possibly use, right? The narrower the metaphor, the more closely it can sink in, right? And it can transform the way people think. Right? Metaphor is really valuable in that way, right? So when I told all of you last week that we are all lost Trojans on our way to Rome, there's a reason I do that, right? I could make a blunt argument about our need to save the planet from ultimate destruction, right? But it's much more interesting to think about how we connect 
to great societal challenges of the past, right? It makes you think differently about what you need to know, right? If you think, oh, I just need to make a clean energy society, great, I'm gonna learn how to build wind turbines, then I'll build as many wind turbines as I, as I possibly can, right? But when you connect it to the grand human social experiment, right, there's a lot more that has to be included, right? It's a, it's, it's a, a really good way to get people to pay attention to you. Um, and also to think differently about what they're trying to do, right? And there's not nearly enough of this in energy policy, right? We try to beat each other over the head with our preconceptions about what we think solutions ought to look like instead of listening to each other and trying to get at a means of shared connection, right? Shared action that may involve some compromise, may not, but it involves listening and thinking about our collective roles, right, in, in this large socio-technical system. How are we doing on time? Let's take a little break, grab a sip of water, stretch your legs. We will come back and we'll discuss uh, Scottish tree farmers, or would-be Scottish tree farmers, who don't like kids in suits telling them what to do. Yeah, unfortunately, that was the one that was the most complicated, so it's probably the one you write like the notes on. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. No, you should uh, you should be able to watch the rest of the lecture uh, through the recording. Oh, um, I should ask: Is anyone who's not in a distance section tried to access the recordings on D2L? Was it successful? Yes. Okay, good. So all of you do have access to the recordings now. Uh, you don't have to be in a distance section to have uh, the recordings. I tried to download it, and there is a hiccup with that. It's crappy, yeah. It, but I could watch it. Okay, okay, good, yeah. I, I think you can download I, I tried, I was testing around, and I had to try like five times before it would download the whole, the whole format. But it is possible. I don't think so. You know, most of my work isn't in Colorado, and so I, I tend to work internationally. But um, well, and, and I, we're giving it short shrift, right? A single class instead of you know, obviously the Center for Environmental Journalism knows this in much greater detail than I ever would. But. Sure, sure, sure. Well, we should think about how to integrate Racy and CEJ. Yeah. One of the fellows is in this class. I don't know who, but. Oh, that's right, that's right, yeah, yeah. So, which is good, but yeah. Great. We should, we should do more of it. Yes. Hey, Herm, how are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. Yeah. I'll probably do you Okay. Yeah, I understand. I understand. <laughs> well, you know, no matter, uh, it's, it's, you know, three, three hours of listening to somebody prattle on will make anybody fall asleep. No, no, no. Thanks, sir. Schultz lecture, yeah, with uh, Paul Jaskow. Yeah. 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 ye
Um, he is um, a leading figure in um, kind of techno-economic modeling, um, really kind of the what we think of as, as policy science, right? the science of policy, as opposed to kind of normative policy, which we do here and, and primarily with done in law school. So he looks at kind of how to model the energy system out and how to use the inputs of those models to improve kind of very geeky technical aspects of, of how energy plans and policies are made. But I know the, um, the ENSC 5000 class will be going to that lecture um, as, as part of the class. So um, I know at least some of them will be there. It's, um, this is 5001. ENSC 5000 is meets on Thursdays. I get confused all the time. Um, yeah, I, I think, so I, I think that means you don't, do you have a problem still with that one, the one? You do, you do, okay. Yeah, I don't know why they would do that. Um, so normally, so you register our statistics creation schedule so that we don't end up overlapping exams and we're not allowed to change our time. Um, in the first place. Um, and so now they've created a situation where we can't change the time and people have to choose them. So I will contact them and figure out what the hell is going on. Yeah, I have all that. Um, for me, no problem because attendance in this course is not mandatory. You can always check up on the lectures afterwards. Um, your other professors may or may not be willing to grant you slack on that. I, I think I think most of it. Um, as for funding, I don't know. You might try. I mean, it's tricky because it's, it's not the CU work. The best bet might be to do something here on campus that relates to it, and then try to kind of shoehorn funding into it that way. Um, have you contacted your previous institution? I mean, you know, you might you might talk to Greg um, about see if, you, if is, is the work energy related. No, maybe find a CU student group that you can come explain your work to and see if they'd be willing to help you out. Right? They often have budgets for this kind of thing, and maybe you could do a talk on your work for them. That's, how kind of, that's my best guess. Sorry, I don't know better advice. I don't know, at ad hoc, so I wouldn't try to partner because they don't have extra money, but find other student groups, like, like there are students in environmental club or something like that, those might be places to start. Yes. It is. Yeah. Um, yeah, that one's in here. 
of 6 to 8.30. It's not 5 to 7 anymore because, um, yeah, our NRL instructors couldn't make it up here any earlier. So it's great that we've got these NRL scientists teaching the course, but they couldn't start it until next. So it's kind of a uh, difficult scheduling situation. But, you know, we're young. Okay, okay, great. Yeah, just let me know if, if you have other things you want to bounce off of. I can, I can get them. I was actually kind of like how my my boss hired me. It was like to originally it was like to get around extra taxes. I was like, all right, I want you to start your own consulting company and hire you. And so I actually like I did. I had a consulting license and so I worked as a consultant for foot and I was able to consult for like two other companies later. I originally that's like it's exactly what it is. Sure, fine, fine. No problem. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, I've not done it service at all. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Good. Uh, we're, we're not giving it proper proper attention with just one class, but I'm sorry, it's helpful. Uh, I remember the story was that when Wittgenstein uh, finished that paper, uh, it was the only thing he ever wrote, right? The only official publication he ever wrote. And he slapped it on Bertrand Russell's desk, and he clapped Bertrand on the shoulder and said, you won't understand the word of it. And he walked out, and Bertrand just nodded. Because he knew. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You won't understand the word. <laughs> It's like, um, uh, I forget, it's a modern philosopher, I forget, I forget their name, um, he said, uh, there is Plato and there is Wittgenstein and everything else is deep. Is it the who? Love it. All right, let's talk, uh, let's talk Scottish farmers. We talked a bit about linguistic scales in the last part, and uh, this one we're going to talk about temporal and spatial scales, right? So there's lots of different what we call scales of disconnection by, um, by this article in the wonderfully named Moravian Geographical Reports, um, a rather obscure journal for this class, but um, geographers have kind of their own unique way of, um, of talking about a lot of these issues. And geography is a really interesting discipline because in a lot of ways it's kind of like, um, they're like the hipster interdisciplinarians, you know, they were doing interdisciplinarity before it was cool. Um, and, and, and right, you know, within, and, and most people don't even know what geography is. We all presume that like geographers are people who memorize countries on maps, right? But actually geographers are deeply embedded in these questions related to landscapes, and human ecology, and really the development of society, but they have a kind of dense language that they use to, 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 to describe those things. And so it requires, as always, a bit of translation. Um, so let's talk, we talk about a spatial disconnect. We're talking really about geospatial disconnects, right?
And beyond just what we're talking about here, we'll talk about the specifics of this in a moment. What are some interesting examples of, of spatial disconnects? Morgan is laughing, I think, at how terrible my handwriting is, and you have every right to. <laughs> Geospatial with parentheses. <laughs> yeah, David. Um, I think in some of the ways that island nations are being affected by um, global warming and rising sea levels is something that is very out of sight and out of mind for a lot of us that um, otherwise aren't affected by that. Yeah. Um, and that the discussions around those concerns are often kind of not as productive as we'd like them to be because of that disconnect. Yeah. I think it was in, uh, in Copenhagen in 2009 when um, it really, Copenhagen looked like it was going to fall apart until about the 11th hour. Um, Copenhagen was where we got a roadmap to Paris. So Paris essentially occurred, which we'll talk about next week, because of the Copenhagen Climate Accord, which was a, a, a path forward, right? Without that, um, negotiations would effectively have fallen apart completely. Um, and uh, the United States at the time was, uh, was, was holding that process up. Uh, and uh, I think it was 2009, I'll double check this. Uh, the representative, the, the, the ambassador from Papua New Guinea, uh, which is obviously threatened by rising seas to a great extent, essentially engaged in this kind of deeply shame-oriented argument that said, um, you know, you, 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 can't, you can't sit there and fiddle while our islands are swallowed, right? Lead, follow, or get out of the way. And that actually caused a change of heart uh, from the United States negotiators. Uh, it was the reason that, that Copenhagen worked, right? So there was a, an example of effective linguistic usage, right? These impacts to island nations which occur on these spatial scales, which we normally don't think about, can nonetheless be reframed in a way that makes them really relevant in a kind of absolute normative sense. What are some other scales for energy? Um, there's the whole, uh, I guess, disconnect between people who use energy and people who have to bear the impacts yeah. of energy being produced. So people never want a power plant in their backyard, but they do want power generated uh, by that power plant. Yeah, we call this environmental justice, right? The notion that we tend to push pollution impacts onto communities that have low access to the political system, right? Um, a good example is uh, an area called Cancer Alley in Louisiana. Anyone familiar with this? Yeah, go ahead. What's Cancer Alley? Uh, it's a, a region in the, in the Mississippi River that is just loaded with petrochemical and cal and all sorts of chemical plants in a history of, of not um, mitigating their emissions or has resulted in incredibly high cancer rates among kids especially. Yeah. In that yeah. And, and of course, the population is primarily African American and very poor. Uh, and so the petro petrochemicals which are exported elsewhere for us to use in our cars, most of the severe health impacts are borne by those people. Um, right, and so that's, a, that's an aspect of what geographers would call a spatial disconnect, right? What's, what's problematic about that from uh, beyond just the moral perspective, right? What's problematic about that from an economic efficiency perspective? Any economists in the audience? Great. Well, how much do we end up paying for medical tasks, medical care for these people? Like, they're poor, they can't afford medicine on their own, so Medicare has to pay for yeah, if they get it at all, right? Um, right. There, there's what's what's the word that we use in economics? Externalities. Externalities. Right. And an externality means means a specific thing, right? We 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 kind of toss the term externality around to mean equivalent to pollution, but there's an there's another aspect to to what defines an externality, right? An externality is a cost that is born by someone else, right? So not the person who is benefiting from uh, the consumption of the service itself, but it's, it's basically pushed onto someone else without their consent, right? What are some examples of externalities, Adrian? Smog, but couldn't you have yeah. like a positive externality also? Yeah, yeah, what's a positive externality? smell of a good restaurant? Sure. <laughs> Public parks. 
are a positive externality. Libraries are an externality, right? In, in this case, the benefits are enjoyed by someone other than who's paying for them, right? So it's the reverse. With a negative externality, we just flip that around to talk about cost. So smog is an example of a negative externality. What others? Yeah. Maybe like all like uh, the whole coal uh, production. That, I mean, isn't it not like uh, the rich people have to dig out uh, all these coal in the, like in the mines, which of course is not uh, that healthy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. More. Um, pollution in the Mississippi River Basin that affects like fishing industry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a decrease in property values, like or home values, your chemical plants, refineries, and such. Uh, others? What about, how about, ex can, are externalities only associated with fossil fuels? No. What are some externalities associated with renewable energy technologies? Ruining a good view. Ruining a good view. View shed problems, yeah. Wind turbines make loud noises. Loud noises, cavitation, right? People claim they get horrifically nauseous. <laughs> uh, yeah. Trump said killing all the birds. Killing all the birds, right? Zap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Dams affect river ecology. Huge, right? Hydro is enormously ecologically destructive. Right? And, and not just ecologically destructive, um, you know, in, in areas where large dams are often developed in um, developing countries to serve large growing urban populations, indigenous peoples in those regions are often forcibly displaced. Um, I mean, the, the, there's a lot of um, literature about this uh, from uh, or related to the World Bank uh, in the 90s, uh, which is just heartbreaking. I mean, you know, people essentially drowning themselves to death in protest rather than moving because it's their ancestral lands. Um, what else? But hell, you know, the Bundys. Regardless of whether you think the Bundys are right or not, they certainly believe that that's their land, right? And those are real impacts. Yeah. What are some others? The externalities or spatial mismatches? Either one. You got any more externalities? There's one, uh, people often don't think about geothermal, uh, but the process for creating geothermal power generation is effectively the same as fracking, right? You have to crack open that hot, dry rock and flood water into it to make that work. And so all of the potential externalities you get with fracking, groundwater contamination, induced seismicity, um, trucking traffic from all of the water that has to be moved there, water displacement impacts, all that affects geothermal power generation. Yeah. With fracking, there are a lot of earthquakes, especially in Oklahoma right now, just from the moving of the earth. Yeah, yeah. This is actually, interestingly, um, there's not so much from fracking itself as from the wastewater disposal. When they have to dispose of wastewater from fracking, that tends to cause most of the earthquakes. My, uh, my wife uh, uh, inherited a number of ancestral ranch lands in Oklahoma when her parents passed away, and so she spent a number of years there disposing of these properties. And uh, last year she was there and woke up every morning to the house shaking and the sound of a bomb going off. And that was the fracking wastewater being disposed of outside Cushing, Oklahoma. Every morning, it's incredible, yeah. Well, a big thing now is methane leakage from natural gas production and distribution. Yeah, tell us more about that. What's the concern? Well, I mean, I mean there's an immediate concern that it'll blow up and you know cause a crater in the, in the middle of a city if there's like a leaking pipeline or something. But the larger concern is climate change. And you know, you can see, I think there's an area like in Southern California maybe where there's just plumes of, of methane coming up and it's a huge contributor to global warming. Yeah, it's uh, uh, Utah, uh, the Utah Basin has had a number of aerial surveys over it that show troublingly, not only are there big methane emissions, but the, the aerial views seem to be showing orders of magnitude larger fugitive methane emissions than we would have expected from bottom-up estimates of leakage that we use at the EPA. And so there's big concerns as just how much methane is going up right now, right? And that's, that's something affected. And that, of course, connects into wind integration. How? Disperses it, yeah? Yeah, any guesses here? We haven't quite gotten to this yet. So well, it addresses the cyclical nature of the wind power. Yeah, right. Natural gas power generation makes wind cheaper, right? Because it means that wind power plants don't have to cover their um, moments when they're not generating with high cost uh, 
coal-fired electricity that they buy or other kinds of ancillary services, right? So the integration costs of wind has come down because of increased use of natural gas in the power system. So wind power is benefiting from the gas sector, which means that a negative externality of wind generation is fugitive methane emissions to some extent, right? It gets really complicated really fast, right? I'm not trying to point fingers at the wind industry, I'm just trying to point out that our kind of simplistic narratives about the white hats versus the black hats get really complicated and often don't hold up when we start getting into the complexities of the issues. Yeah. The other spatial disconnect I was thinking about was people who live in cities and people who live in rural areas. Yeah, 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 yeah. Totally different priorities or views on things. Like somebody who's used to, you know, apartment in New York may not have the same idea about someone who lives on a cow ranch in Texas. Right, right. I mean, if 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 you're if you're a if you're a Washington D.C. dwelling D Street liberal that wants to uh, impose new fuel economy standards on light trucks. You may have very different ideas about what an appropriate amount of power to a truck is than somebody who works on a ranch. Right. And it doesn't mean that you can't pass a fuel economy standard, but it means that a lot of times the concerns of those people are, are lessened, right? They're not represented in the discourse. And that creates backlash, right? Which is ultimately very counterproductive uh, to trying to get anything pushed forward. Any other, other spatial disconnects that we see generally, John? Well, kind of a spatial disconnect that you might consider a negative externality would be the uh, environmental cost of manufacturing, say, solar panels. Sure. So you're, you've got a, a NITS in a separate place. Well, right, right, right. Not to mention, the, you know, there's the environmental cost of doing it as well as kind of the rare earth metals aspect, right? That solar panels require all these rare earth metals and they're hard to find. That creates geopolitical disconnects. Well, also, like the biggest impacts of global warming are on the poles. Like, yeah. There's very few people that live actually live there, so yeah. they're actually directly impacted. So therefore, in the short term, people are not really thinking about it because it doesn't directly impact the vast majority of population. But it will be long term effects. Right. 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 I, I think there was, there was an article last week uh, in I think it was in the New York Times about an Alaskan fishing village and a, a native. Native American Alaskan fishing village uh, that's having to move the entire village because the permafrost has effectively melted around their village. And so all of their buildings are just falling over, right? And so they have to move now. So they've lived here for an enormous amount of time and they've decided they have to move it, right? And the costs of that are not really borne by those of us who are enjoying cheap gas necessarily. Yeah. Isn't it bad that, like, I don't know that? Like, what do you <laughs> Like, wouldn't you want the news to tell you something? Like, well, there's so much bad news out there. How would you how would you even ingest all of it, right? But that's good or bad. That is, it's such a wonderful explanation of how all of this is happening, right? It's not that people are evil, right? It's that we don't have the bandwidth, right? I mean, you know, every once in a while people are evil, right? But you know, most people are not evil, you know? People who work in the oil and gas industries are not evil people. They're just trying to make a living like everybody else, you know? And they're not necessarily being faced with this every day. They, they may not have the luxury of getting a master's degree in environmental studies, right? Um, that's, 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 and that, that affects their worldview. And, and you have to be careful about how you approach things that impact various folks. Um, I worked on a project for the NRDC uh, two years ago uh, that involved interviews with people in the natural gas industry. And um, it was interesting because from the NRDC's perspective, this was just a matter of bringing stakeholders together and creating a dialogue and developing voluntary standards to reduce methane emissions. And um, I mean, the level of vitriol directed at the environmental community by natural gas drill drillers was completely disconnected from the NRDC's conception of just how negative that perception was, uh, right? And it was because of the kind of the history, right, that led up to this, the enmity that came up from decades and decades and decades of opposition. Um, has made it very difficult to make these kinds of these kinds of agreements work because they're not even willing to come and sit down at the table. I mean, I was just the academic on the end of the phone line doing the interview, and I had this guy in California literally scream at me for 40 minutes. And I mean, it just didn't cover oil and gas. I mean, this covered gun rights and lands, and I mean, it was. I got the whole like earful, right? And I said, "Oh, thank, thank you for your perspective, sir. Thank, thank, thank you, thank you, thank you. Hey, what else you could do?" <laughs> Okay, so let's talk more specifically now. Um, 
Let's talk about biomass, because that's what this article is kind of about. It's, right? it's about a biomass plant, right? And there's this notion here. Um, we talk about perennial energy crops, or PECs. What's a perennial energy crop? What are we talking about? Something that comes back every year? Every other year, maybe? Every year. Every year, right? Comes back every year. <laughs> what, what are we talking about here? Are we, are we planting, are we burning petunias, bunnies? They burn bunnies in Sweden. <laughs> Frozen bunnies, the real thing, look it up. Yeah, the, uh, the power plants around them, they, they take, there are lots of dead rabbits around the power plants because they have a rabbit infestation problem, and so they get little bunny sickles, and they've started to burn them for energy because I mean, they're already dead. True. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to make sure you're not just freezing the bunnies to burn them, right? That's a negative energy input to energy output problem. But I'm, a, I'm a horrible human being. Okay. So, um, so there's, there's a, let's see, where is it? We're on page, page eight, uh, second column, third paragraph down. The dominant land uses in southwest Scotland at present are dairy farming and forestry. But the region's soils and climate offer significant biophysical potential for PECs, especially for willow grown on short rotation coppice, which is never explained to anyone in the paper, which is terribly frustrating. But uh, what, what the hell is willow grown in short rotation? By the way, welcome to interdisciplinary work. What the hell is that? Willow grown on short rotation coppice. What are we doing? Yeah, Patrick. Yeah, yeah, yeah you got it. You got it. Is it when, like, Planted in this region, and then next year it's in another region. I'm just guessing. I have no yeah, I mean, crop rotation seems seems logical, right? We're rotating it. What does it mean? Short, short rotation. It's on a couple year basis. Yeah, we're not building big willow trees, right? We're getting little shrubs, and then we're we're burning them, right? And then what do we notice about this, right? So it's it's um. There's a key reason why the energy company E.ON, um, which is one of the largest energy conglomerates in Europe, um, it's basically the equivalent of Berkshire Hathaway in Europe, um, decided to build a 44 megawatt CHP biomass power station. What's CHP? Combined heat and power. How does that work? Remember our Carnot limit, which tells us that if we're boiling some kind of a, a, a liquid in order to create steam, in order to turn a turbine, we lose a lot of that energy and heat. Yes, sir? Yeah, so like basically you just like take all the, that heat that you couldn't like get, uh, transform in the, in the generator and then you use that to heat up a household. Yeah. And therefore you can get like an efficiency of like up to 90%. Yeah. And Thor, I know you're an expert on many things energy, but why do you think you know more about this than Americans do? <laughs> uh, because, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, like in Denmark we have like uh, one of like, like far the most households has uh, this uh, district heating system. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, you mean that households in Europe don't have individual electric or gas furnaces, one per house? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they don't? You mean I'm not duplicating my infrastructure in every single house? That's incredible. I mean, surely they just came up with this like two years ago because it's super high tech, right? Super new. No, no, it's been around for a while. How long have they been doing it for? I don't know. I don't know when we started. It's just always like been there. Yeah, <laughs> long time, right? So Europe has a very different means of, of handling space heating and cooling from the United States um, because uh, community density is so high. Um, you have centralized heating and cooling plants, and then the air itself is moved um, through the system uh, between many, many, many houses. Um, so that's what, that's what where CHP was used before. We used combined heat and power in the United States, but not in residential settings. We use it for factories. Um, so you see it in a lot of industrial facilities. There was a big push during the Carter administration to um, improve use of combined heat and power in, in factories. Um, so that, that's kind of where we see it there. But in, in Europe, it's, it's a big component of primary energy demand because it's how most people heat their homes. Unless they live out in the countryside, they often have a locally owned distribution system whose job it is to um, either to have you know, a furnace or some kind of electrical component that creates hot air and pushes it 
into homes. And then the idea behind combined heat and power is that you co-locate that with a power plant. So the power plant can sell power to the grid and it can also provide all of your space heating, right? And what's the advantage of doing that? Why do that instead of just giving people electricity at point use and then having them convert it to heat there? Thor. Because you're, you're like, when you create electricity, you always get this extra heat. And if you don't like send it out to uh, heat up uh, people's houses, you don't have to like uh, uh, just like uh, uh, get rid of it in like in the sea or the ocean or yeah. in a cooling tower. Yeah. Um, so I mean, you have you have it anyway when you want to create electricity. It's just a, like a byproduct of creating electricity. Yeah. You skip a conversion loss, right? If you if you burn coal and create heat, and then that heat is turned into electricity, you're getting conversion losses at each stage, right? So if you've got heat and you can use it directly as opposed to turning it into an energy carrier like electricity, you're saving energy up the chain, just like Emory Levins was talking about, right? So district heating is one of those things that's like a, it's tremendously efficient, but we have trouble using it in the United States. Why? Yeah, no problem, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Brian. Is someone else controlling your heat in that situation? Uh, it, it's, it, there's a utility entity that's either municipally owned or otherwise that controls it, so, so much the same way you get it. Thermostat in your house, no. That would be the issue. no, no, not an issue, yeah. Uh, aren't the, the, wouldn't the end users be so far away from the locations that that heat is generated that it would be inefficient? Yeah, we've got a legacy system of very large cities, which makes it very difficult to install district heating systems, right? Because we're not dense the way European cities are. There are dense pockets in the United States, but it just hasn't taken off um, for a variety of reasons. But a good example of technological lock-in, right? Our socio-technical system built, built on cheap energy, cars, and big grids has led to a system that perpetuates cars, big grids, and cheap energy, as opposed to kind of high infrastructure costs that lead to benefits down the road, right? Yeah, Adrian. Uh, I've seen this in uh, Iceland also. Yeah. It's much less dense, even in the countryside. They have combined heat and power, um, but I think maybe because it's so cheap. Yeah. Uh, Where does Iceland get all that heat from? Geothermal. Geothermal, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, not only are they not having to convert it to electricity, it's basically free heat, right? It's, it's, it's obviously their their economies are a bit different, right? You can afford to spend more on pipelines and infrastructure when your fuel is free. Right. Yeah. Even in a dense system, how does the air stay warm as it's moving from the plant in Denmark, which isn't particularly warm, to the house? I mean, is every type pipe just like wrapped in insulation? It's underground. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's underground, underground below the vein of stem. stem. So six feet down, if you dig six feet down, when we bury people there, the temperature is constant. Um, so you're, you then insulate your pipe and you're able to move it through. Yeah. Even, even with the, the insulation losses, if you were to do them above ground, which some do, it still pales in comparison to the losses you get by converting that heat to electricity and then back in the house, right? Because you get hit on both ends. Yeah. It's a, it's a historical note. I don't know if that's much, but I know that some small company towns around the United States did get their central heat from the factory where most of the people in the town worked. Yeah, like yeah. I, the town I grew up in had like a an oven or range plant and they supplied heat to the entire town because almost everyone worked there. It was yeah. like a municipal gift. Yeah, and yeah. And that, that's right. This was very popular at the turn of the century in many places. I don't know if that was the case with that town, but um, if you go to downtown Denver, for example, Denver has a steam loop that serves all of its public buildings in the downtown area. So if you go to the Denver Courthouse or the Colorado State Legislature, all of those are served by a steam loop, or it used to be. Yeah. I see you does some of that. Because yeah, we have our own central heating system. Got steam tunnels and stuff. That's actually the only thing the power plant on 18 does, because the energy is cheaper from Excel, but they still do heating. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, we have our own plant. If you know where Atlas is on main campus, there's a plant right on the other side of that. That's what that's there for. It's a central heating system. So you can see it happening in some places. Uh, Pagosa Springs as well, for those of you new to Colorado, uh, skip I-70 and go straight to Wolf Creek for skiing. Uh, stay in Pagosa Springs and you can check out the steam system as well as the wonderful hot springs. All right. So we're at combined heat and power. 
UK's first biomass power station commissioned in 2009, costing 90 million pounds, requires 480,000 tons of wood fuel per annum. We have no idea what that means because it's hard to know, right? You have to go look up, like, what's the average usage of wood per annum? Um, the company's stated aim at the outset was to source 20% of this total from willow grown by farmers within a 60-mile radius, requiring the establishment of some 4,000 hectares of SRC, short rotation coppice, right? So we've got the plant. I know all my plants look alike. We'll put a, if I try to draw a leaf, draw a leaf it's just going to look like a pot, but it will do. <laughs> Growth industry. <laughs> Some of you may find yourselves working in it on the planet side, right? So we've got our biomass power plant, but there's an inherent issue with biomass power plants, right? And it's that to get the same amount of energy that I have in this, I need way, way more wood, right? I have to source so much biomass to get what is contained in this little rock that it quickly becomes uneconomic to source the fuel from further and further away, right? Because you start, you build your plant in the middle of a forest, okay? You start cutting down the forest. But then what happens? The more you cut down the forest, the further you have to go, right? So you have to build your biomass power plant in a range that has a crop that can be grown very quickly. Right? Because if we grow, if we go too far out, then we end up using too much gasoline to get the fuel back and forth, right? It's hard to use biomass for electricity generation if you can't basically rely on a largely self-contained, fast-growing crop. And that's kind of the, the principle behind biomass power development, right? And a biomass plant works exactly the same way as a coal plant does. You can basically convert a coal plant to biomass very cheaply. Many of them run on combined systems where you combine coal ash with biomass at the same time. Yes, sir. But like, uh, like many of the, like, the power plants in Denmark we have to use biomass also get the wood like all the way from America. So like we ship them a long way. Oh yeah, yeah. Why, why is shipping potentially different than trucking? Do you think shipping is cheaper or more expensive than trucking per, per unit of distance? Does it have to do with the friction of like transport? Yeah, Whereas yeah. Once you get up to your momentum on water, you're gliding. Yeah, exactly. It's way cheaper to ship stuff than to truck it. Yeah. And I would think human costs would be important too. I mean, truck with its own driver. Right. Until Elon Musk gets his hands on it. Yeah, yeah. And 60% and of the American workforce is suddenly out of the job. Right? Yeah, there's one guy who can like steer a uh, football-length supercarrier or whatever. Yeah, yeah. We often hear this talked about in terms of the last mile costs of distribution, right? Have you heard this metaphor before? That the last mile of distribution for most goods and services is often the most expensive. Here it's not quite true, actually, right? The last, the, the, these last few miles aren't too bad because you're just going out and back, right? But once you're sourcing from outside, the further you get to deliver the good, the more expensive the total trip becomes, right? And so it's, it becomes harder and harder to make this sufficient. So the Scottish government, uh, in their infinite wisdom, decided we're going to take all of these farmers in this area and we're going to convert them into energy crop growers, right? Sounds great, right? I'm gonna, I'm, we're gonna take these folks, I bet they're just gonna love this. They're gonna love the idea that they're helping their country become energy independent. And what happened instead? It didn't fit their culture. Yeah, it didn't fit their culture, Davis. Uh, yeah, I mean, you had a pretty major cultural pushback from the farmers who felt like these crops they were being asked to grow were alien to them in some ways, and um, that it wasn't, I don't, I don't, farming energy crops isn't why they got into the industry yeah. in the first place. I grow food, <laughs> not energy. Why is that a powerful statement? What is it about that that's powerful? Yeah. Just the lifestyle and just how you identify yourself as providing yeah. service to society. Yeah. Right? Identity. And identity is really important. Uh, this is a similar for those of you that maybe take anybody taking foundations of natural resources at the law school this semester? 
If you haven't heard Charles Wilkinson talk about the one time he didn't understand that sheep farmers and cow farmers were entirely different cultures, it's a great story. Um, sheep farmers do not do cow farming and vice versa. Um, you, you, that's part of who you are, right? What does that mean, right? Identity is derived from a Latin word, idem. Means the same, the same. Right. So an identity are things that are the same as me. And so things that are associated with people become not just something that they do, but part of how they conceptualize themselves, how they make meaning out of their lives, right? And so it's not so easy as simply going to, uh, going to a crop farmer that produces food that sees themselves as the critical first step, right, in the provision of sustenance to human beings and saying, oh, well, we're going to have you grow stuff and then we're going to burn it. Because that's... That's, I mean, that's, that's what's happening, right? Imagine if you're the farmer in that situation, you know, you've got, you have this whole image of what your life means, right? You produce crops, and those go to a market, and people buy those, and they turn them into delicious food, and people enjoy them. And that's, that's a whole narrative about your role in the human species, right? And suddenly, this is a very different role. Not necessarily a bad one, but that's a jarring change. Sure. Um, so they built the plant first. Yeah. And I don't understand why, like, there are people who work on social science and stuff, where were those people when they were like building this plant? That's a great question. Where the hell were the social scientists? At the university. At the university. <laughs> right? That's where social scientists are. They don't work for energy companies. I mean, the city of uh, uh, Excel Energy did the same thing here, right? They came to town and they built a smart grid without ever asking anyone if anyone wanted one. <laughs> it's an abysmal failure. Right? And it's actually informed a lot of the municipalization debate. Excel is still fighting its black eye from the smart grid uh, that, that they tried to create five years ago. A smart grid is um, essentially an IT-enabled electricity grid. So it uses a variety of um, information technology-enabled uh, devices to improve the flow of electricity and to improve metering and billing and uh, hopefully to integrate uh, sources of variable generation more efficiently. Um, in reality, what it is is uh, firing people from being uh, meter readers. Uh, it, it allows you to not have to pay people to do what they call truck rolls in utility parlance, where you have to drive out to a neighborhood and go read the meter, right? You, you, many of you may not even remember this, but you know, like, like there used to be somebody, because they haven't done it in a very long time. Originally, you would have somebody called the meter man. He would show up, or the meter lady, who would show up, to your house and they'd read how much electricity you would consume and then you'd get that on your bill. After a while, electricity uh, companies simply started averaging whatever they thought your, your average monthly consumption was and you could contest it, but it was, it was pretty much in the noise. And with smart meters, as they call them, uh, now they have two-way communication between the meter and the utility. So it allows the utility to know exactly how much energy you are consuming, when. Um, so it helps them bill you more effectively. It helps them... Um, plan their generation better for kind of what load is doing on a 15 minute to 15 minute basis. And it helps them cut down on the personnel as well. Um, and it was sold as a means of essentially turning, the, the object was to turn consumers into prosumers. What's a prosumer? Well, let's just unpack that fake word, right? <laughs> Proactive consumer who produces energy, right? So the idea behind this was that it was going to enable the people of Boulder to build their own renewable electricity systems and engage in this growing uh, multi-scalar market for renewable energy, right? And of course, five years down the road, Excel is trying to shut down net metering because it's been far too successful. <laughs> it's kind of funny. <laughs> Not for Excel. Not for Excel. <laughs> Yeah, it is. One thing that I was thinking about reading the article when they were bringing up this idea of transitioning from a, from their role as kind of food producer to energy producer is the idea that food is fuel for us, right? I mean, yeah. I, I, mean yeah. I know it has taken on other importance in terms of you know, social gathering that, that you know, is associated with it, but yeah. 
on some level, they're producing fuel for energy. Yeah. Whether it is in the form of wood or food. Right. right. And that, that seemed to be something that was lost in the analysis a little bit, was <laughs> they had this great pushback. But yeah. At, I, I, I mean, I don't know. The, the role is, on some level, I think, similar. Yeah. Yeah. And it was fun. I think just like going off of that, like a big part of that is just the uncertainty of the situation. Like they don't, they don't have any experience producing willow. And so a lot of it is just the fear of doing something new that they're not used to. Yeah. Yeah. Kira. I think a lot of it is like emotion. Like you can't feed your child willow. You know, you can't like go to a farmer's market and give people willow. Yeah. You can't that warn your child with strawberries either. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, maybe this would have been a good thing for them to start explaining to people before just telling them, oh, you're going to be energy crop rotators now, right? I mean, that's tough. Hey, Adrian. On that same theme, uh, I studied agriculture in undergrad, and our farm manager described the 300 acres as big solar panels. Uh, and we we uh, grew solar energy that our cows ate, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then we we also went to Denmark and we visited farmers there who uh, who diversified their uh, crops with either uh, on land or uh, off land wind turbines. So I think a lot of people do think about mm -hmm. it as mm -hmm. a very similar. Yeah. Yeah, type of well, and, and it, it works if you're, especially right, if you're trying to get urban, highly educated urban people to engage and find farming interesting, right? Because we, we, there's a stereotype of farming as something done by dumb people, right? Even though that's not true at all. Maybe one of the ways to, it's almost the reverse of what we're trying to do in this case, right? Where you're trying to communicate to people who are thinking, oh, I want to go save the world with solar panels, that there's a lot of other ways to engage with solar energy that are just as, if not more important. Yeah. Problem with this was that they went to dairy farmers and not a crop farmer. And I worked on a dairy for one summer, and I worked yeah. doing vegetables for one summer, and they were really different things. And I think like it was also a really big deal. They weren't not only asking them to give up their crop, yeah, but I mean it really was their livelihood because working with animals is so different than working with plants. Not to elevate one above the other, but yeah, I mean it just the stupid. Stupidity, right? I mean, the stupidity is just jarring. Like, why on earth would a dairy farmer know anything about planting crops and trees? I mean, that's like that's like coming to talk to me and saying, Adam, I need help writing my will. You're a lawyer. But that'd be the dumbest thing you can do. I don't know the first thing about writing a will. It's been years. <laughs> Well, you could also tell they totally marketed it the wrong way when, when they, they surveyed them and 32% of people said nothing. Yeah. Possibly. Yeah. You tell me if I give you a million dollars, you're not going to grow willows. Like if they're at that level of against it, yeah. that means that, you know, the, whoever were the policymakers totally came off the wrong way towards that population. Yeah. 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 I mean, I had this exact experience when I worked with the natural gas community, right? I mean, those people were at that same level. They, they were not willing to have a dialogue, right? They were, you needed to go five steps back before you could start one, right? What about, um, there's mention here of new risks, new risks and uncertainties, right? That also wasn't considered. What's, what's, what happens if you plant a whole bunch of shrubs, willow shrubs, to your pasture land if you're a dairy farmer? You can't just go try this out, right? I mean, if you make the switch, you're making a long-haul investment, right? I mean, you're buying the condo. Tricky. <laughs> if any of you are buying a condo, be careful. <laughs> Especially in Boulder. <laughs> I thought this was an interesting, um, uh, interesting statement on page, uh, page nine, uh, second column, third paragraph down. 
In itself, this is hardly a new insight. Over two decades ago, Twiddle and Bryce noted that limits to renewable resources are not the potential in the environment, but the institutional factors and collective personal response of the public. And this observation has been repeatedly proved by subsequent experience. Because it is a truth which is continually overlooked and contributes to the common phenomenon of policy implementation gaps, however, it remains an important live issue to highlight. This is a social scientist just like beating against the door like, why don't you listen to us? <laughs> you ever been in meetings with social scientists it's about energy, they're just like angry little storm clouds. Like, <laughs> It is also a contributory factor in the so-called social gap between broad public support for a policy and public opposition to specific proposals, a much-researched issue which has recently been revisited by Bell. You can hear the frustration, right? A much-researched issue. They argue that the understanding such gaps is important not only for the fulfillment of renewable energy ambitions, but more broadly, to explicate the relationship between public opinion and political outcomes in democratic politics more generally. The importance of the social science dimensions of policy implementation is also stressed by Warren, who suggests that, whereas the sustainability challenge was once thought to consist of persuading a soft and malleable society to adjust to hard facts, it would now appear that the inverse situation of soft facts and hard society is perhaps closer to the truth. Facts are contested, whereas social norms and practices prove resistant to change. The story of the development of wind power policy nicely exemplifies this inversion, as does the resistance of Lockerbie farmers to PECs, despite the existence of positive economic and technical facts. Right? Once again, back to what we were talking about in the first part of the class, right, where everyone thinks that the facts drive the change. Right? But there's lots of things underlying the facts that influence how we see the facts and what we even determine are facts, right? what's relevant, what's not. All of those are defined by these kinds of unconscious things. Right? What else? Anybody else find some interesting material in here that we haven't touched on yet? Somebody's got to read the suit-wearing office boys comment. <laughs> Um, I thought it was interesting. Uh, I think they talked somewhere about the uh, like asking the farmers to make this local sacrifice to further a global cause. It's just another example. Like maybe if the willow trees would somehow solve a local environmental problem, the farmers would win a war. You're asking them to make this um, sacrifice of their identity for something that they may never see the outcome of. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right. Help the planet. Screw your life, but help the planet, right? Asking people to make that kind of sacrifice is a hard thing. As one farmer put it, some suit-wearing office boy must have, you have to imagine this in a Scottish accent, must have thought that the hillbilly farmers of southwest Scotland would just subside, sell their herds, and plant willow. <laughs> why is this, why is this a, a, um, a powerful image, right? The suit-wearing office boy. What is, what's, what's lurking in that, that, simple, that simple image? Naivete, right? What else? Yeah. Someone who doesn't get their hands dirty and do manual labor. Yeah, somebody that's never been on the land. What else? Because right. it is in an ivory tower, essentially, disconnected to what people are actually doing on the ground. Yeah. What else? Boy. Why boy? Could have said suit wearing pencil neck. Boy. Why boy? Yeah, and why do you think it was entirely made up, or do you do you have a feeling that maybe the folks making policy in Scotland may be on the younger side compared to farmers? I know. I met with the Scottish Parliament delegation uh, last month, and they're all your age. Sweet. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a generational aspect here, which is really, really relevant to all of you, right? Especially if you're trying to change a system that is occupied by people who are of a different generation, it is really hard to come in as a young person and get them to listen to you if you come in thinking that you know everything, right? Yeah, right. I thought that was one of the interesting things about this article was that it really went into like the scale, the differences in scale. So. Like it's got a cube of box, uh, the graph on page 10 where it's talking about yeah. local versus global, nature versus people, and yeah. versus president. 
something that was reiterated in pretty much all three articles is that the people that are going to bear the consequences for our actions today are in no position to actually affect that policy mm -hmm. because we're too young. Right, right. And, and likewise, we were asking people who weren't aware of the problem to dramatically alter the way things are done, right? And that's, that's a huge challenge, right? Without even assigning moral roles, right? It's just a huge potential challenge. Um, one of the industries that I ran into this in that I worked with was the geothermal heat pump industry. Anyone know what a geothermal heat pump is? Adrian? Uh, it's either a coil or a deep uh, well that it transfers heat instead yep. of producing it. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's driven by an electrical heat pump, which is just an air conditioner is an example of a heat pump. And so it, uh, it moves fluid through a borehole system in the ground, and then that fluid picks up heat from the surrounding ground, which is a constant temperature below the Vedo zone, right? And then it moves it back in, they um, uh, compress it, and then it shoots up the temperature, so it becomes like a superheated gas, and they're able to use it to heat homes. 400% efficient. Um, it's not really a geothermal technology in the sense of like hot geothermal spots, but it uses the ambient heat of the ground. Interestingly, the geothermal heat pump industry is populated almost entirely by former oil rig uh, drillers because that's the skills you need to install one of these things. Anybody can hook up the heat pump. You need somebody that knows how to get a bit through rock, and it's hard. It is not easy to drill through rock. If you think it's just a matter of renting a drilling rig and sending a bit down, you got another thing coming, you start hitting bentonite, you hit the wrong soil, you chew up a drill bit, you gotta buy another drill bit. Sometimes you've gotta go through five of them before you drill a single hole, your costs go through the roof. It's a complicated industry. And it's full of folks that are in their later years, right? And um, they are deeply politically conservative. They're renewable energy people. They identify as renewable energy people, but they're not like those kids putting solar panels up, right? They don't say namaste when you sign their contract. Right? They're there to do their job. I literally had one guy, Terry Proper, to make, they're all gigantic as well, because they're oil rig workers, right? They're all seven feet tall and three men wide, right? I mean, they're enormous giants of human beings. And, uh, and, you know, so I, I had to organize this conference um, to, to help improve data collection uh, for geothermal heat pump installations at the Department of Energy and the School of Mines. And so we brought all these folks into the room, and I'm talking to all these guys like this, right? And the first thing they want me to know is that they're not into this whole Obama nation thing, right? Like, and, I, and, and what they were signaling was, you know, you, we're, we're happy to have you here. We're happy to have you helping. But you better respect our cultural values. Don't tell me how many subsidies we need. Tell me how we make our installations better because that's what mattered to them, right? These were small business people that valued their ability to build systems that were economically viable on their own, on their own, right? That's a whole different discussion, right? But in their minds, this was really important. And that was a key part of making that dialogue work, was being able to translate my language away from the need to address climate change and toward how to make your systems more cost-effective, efficient, and good for your customers, right? And that turned out to be a very successful way to engage with them. And I found, interestingly, that in engaging with other friends of mine who were of that same age group about issues of energy and climate, all of them were more interested in talking about geothermal heat pumps and learning about them than they were talking about solar or wind because to them that was subsidy land, right? And it's important to consider how the, the ways in which we think about how people construct images may be different than the way they actually construct them. You would think, well, these guys are oil workers. They're always going to be pro-oil. But they weren't, right? They made the switch, just not in the way that people thought they'd make the switch. And it was because nobody from the government came to say, oh, all you oil workers, we're going to train you to be solar thermal plant operators. Right? Which, uh, there's an actual movement to try to do that, even though running a solar thermal plant and drilling an oil rig have nothing to do with each other. Right? You have to give people some flexibility right? in order, to, in order to, to, to move the needle forward. Anyone else have any anecdotes, cult experiences from the cultural fronts? On either side, really. I mean, we shouldn't presume that everyone in here is a, is a you know, solar panel totem liberal, right? It's okay to have different political opinions. It's really important to have different political opinions, especially if you work in renewable energy. You know, we need conservatives working in renewable energy. Making them feel like they don't belong is the worst possible thing we can do. What else we got? Other thoughts? 
have anything else here I wanted to bring up? Sites, places, meaning, value, identity. We talked about that. Short scale, long scale. And then it gets into some hand waving about global governance. But we're going to skip that in favor of Philip Howell. So I'm going to start this. Um, it's a um, this is a longer lecture. It's about an hour. We've only got uh, we've only got 20 minutes left. So I'll just kind of get you going on it. Um, so Philip Allen, to give you by way of background, is a um, he is a professor emeritus of public international law at Cambridge. Um, he's a fascinating guy. He worked in the UN for 40 years um, as a, as a British diplomat, um, and he has kind of very unique conceptions of how to move global society forward. And he answers this question that's raised at the end of, um, of the Lockerbie paper. And we didn't even get to otters. We'll get to that uh, next time, because that fits in with climate. Right, this, um, this scales of governance question, right? How do we reconcile the needs of global governance without um, identification with an attachment to liberal democratic norms of self-determination and government by the people, right? You need this great need for some kind of coordinating aspect. And yet, kind of like we, we touched on briefly last week, there's this tension between our liberal democratic values in, in the small l sense, right? Our value of self-determination, our value of self-government, our value of the laboratories of governance. Um, and this need for global organization. Um, and, and kind of the question that arises is, um, what's, what's the source of the problem here, right? We presume, the article says, for example, that they think maybe democracy is the problem. Is there some fundamental conflict between democracy and global resource governance and ecological sustainability? And where Alex is interesting is, I think he, he finds a nuance in there that's missed by most others. And it's that he says democracy is not the problem. The nation state is the problem. And because we think of the nation state as a natural thing, um, we don't think of the ways in which we can change the way nation states interact with one another. And so he's highly theoretical, but also he has a very practical background. And um, he's got some interesting thoughts about the origins of nation states, which only date to the 1600s. It's a very relatively recent thing. Um, and how those origin stories tend to inform what we think is natural within the geopolitical order. Um, so I'll leave you with that. If you want to stick around for a bit afterwards um, to watch more of it, you can, or you can find it uh, on the internet. I'll post a link on D2L. Um, but uh, if you need to leave right at 7.45, that's totally fine as well. Oh, I need volume. Let's see, what am I missing here? There we go. No, maybe not. Thwarted again by technology. Can you help? I'm sorry. <laughs> what am I missing here? Maybe it's on the, the files are in the computer. It's <laughs> all on. Do you think? <laughs> I had this working just the other day. I don't know what's, why it's not working now. We have this integrated tablet thing, which does like 80 different functions. And like, it took us a whole week to figure out that all we had to do to make the marker work on this was to flip one of the switches off, and none of us knew to look there. Another great example of uh, the, f the failure of technological determinism, right? This is a great system. It's not the problem. <laughs> oh, right, right, yeah, totally. Thoughts? Okay.
Nothing yet. That's okay. You know, we can um, we can figure this out and do it uh, do it next lecture as a follow up to uh, to our guest speaker. So let's chat. Um, let's chat otters in our last uh, our last bit here. I mean discount rates. All right, so um, uh, David Roberts, uh, who's the author of this piece, is a blogger. Uh, this is from back when he was at Gris, which is a kind of, um, uh, it's normally kind of an activist liberal blog, although David Roberts is, um, I think, quite a bit more kind of even-handed and analytical than most other writers there. So he's now at Vox, um, which is a different political blog, but um, just one of the most insightful people writing blog pieces on the energy transition. Um, I'd recommend reading things whenever you see him talking about energy or climate. Um, he's very sharp. Um, and uh, he also kind of looks like an otter himself. If you ever seen him speak, he has like this wonderful beard. Um, and he's, he's, uh, he's just, you, you, you would think that, again, it kind of challenges the common notion that the people who are best at communicating climate change are climate scientists, right? David Roberts is a journalist. Um, that's his job, and he is better at communicating climate than any climate scientist I've ever seen. He's really, really good. Um, so he gives us all these otters because he wants to explain a discount rate. So those of you that are in business school will know instantly what a discount rate is, but you might have trouble explaining it to people who aren't in business school. So let's try an experiment. Let's try explaining discount rates to non-MBAs. Anyone want to try it? It's a good exercise if you're an MBA student. Here. Not explain discount rates. But okay. I thought we read Elliot. What is? Oh, um, so uh, Elliot, I'm skipping just because there's not a whole lot to talk about um, with him that I want to cover that wasn't already stated in the article. This was um, a this was on the schedule, but it wasn't on D2L. So if you missed this one, um, I apologize. I should have given you a heads up about it. It was a link because it's a link to the blog article. Yeah. Uh, I'll take a stab at it. Yeah, go for it. Loudly. 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 Um, Loudly. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so the value of a dollar today is not the same as the value of a dollar t tomorrow. Uh, everybody knows about inflation. So typically we have about 3% inflation each year. Why does that happen? Why do we have inflation? Can't, Can't we, we just, just keep the dollar the same? Uh, there's a lot of different reasons. Uh, Say we have uh, more or less money in the economy, it changes the value of the, the dollar. Uh -huh. What's, What's the, the fundamental the psychological driver for the time value of money, as you call it, right? What is it? Yeah. It stimulates growth. It makes people use their money. See, we're not getting to the core here, right? We're repeating things that we hear from economists. What, what's driving it? What's the base, John? Uncertainty. Uncertainty. Yeah. Tell me more. Why does uncertainty drive this differentiation in value? Well, if you have uh, you know, 100 bucks now or 100 bucks in 10 years, you think it would be the same. But who knows what can happen in 10 years? I mean, of course, you have inflation. You have all these things. Opportunity costs of money. But you also, you know, somebody who might promise to give you 100 bucks in 10 years may not be there. It may not work out yeah. the way you uh, anticipate. So much can happen. Yeah, right. Doesn't an economy grow with the creation of value essentially so if you've got a town that farms they then create hundred dollars worth of wealth from farming that then you take that hundred dollars and invest into a factory that creates five hundred dollars worth of wealth for that town so is it it's like a Really hard. Yeah. <laughs> it's really hard to describe this kind of Like it's not. There's not like a set pool of money in the world that everyone shares and fights over. It. Because as you introduce more people with growing population that mm -hmm. do more things to create more value while consuming more goods. Was that always the case? Was, was there ever a time, time in history where, where there was, was a set pool of money? money? There was. It was the gold standard. Yeah. Right. The gold standard, silver standard, there have been attempts to go back to that sometimes. The tally stick. The tally stick, yeah. Um, 
you're familiar with, with Bitcoin, right? This is an example. This is a, an attempt to create a, a cryptocurrency that acts like um, hard currency. It acts like gold being discovered by creating these mathematical algorithms that mine fictional places to create things of value. It's fascinating, right? But what's What's driving this, right, is A, a sense of uncertainty, and this preference for money now. Because what's the ultimate uncertainty? I might get hit by a bus on my way out of here. I want that dollar now, not tomorrow, because I might not get to use it tomorrow, right? Is that a general preference for just instant gratification? You know, that's a good question. I suspect there's more to it than that. It has to do with investment behavior, because... We're, we're, what we're talking about when we're talking about kind of economic concepts of time value of money, we're really talking about investment preferences. So it's not just wanting a dollar now because I want a dollar and I can spend it on an ice cream cone, right? But it means that if I'm going to take that $100 preference, see, that's a good word. Let's, let's fix that there. Sorry, distant folks. Man, my brain just goes right out the window in the last 15 minutes, I swear. Right, but we have, if we're going to take that $100 and I'm going to invest it, into some kind of venture that's going to try to return me money, right? If I can do that now, I want that $100 to turn into something else or I wouldn't invest it in the first place. Or I would find something else to invest it in, right? And it's, it's this, um, what's, what's this concept called? Opportunity cost. One of the most ignored concepts in energy transformation. You see this all the time, right? Um, say there's a brand new ultra efficient furnace that just came out, right? And that furnace has a payback period of four years, right? So if I buy this furnace, uh, it's going to pay me back uh, the, the extra cost over a standard furnace in four years based on the energy savings that I'm going to realize from getting this furnace as opposed to the standard one on the market. For whatever reason, I bought the standard furnace. Tons of people do. People pass up the opportunity to buy the more expensive but more intelligent choice. Why? Yeah. Well, the payback on a furnace is much longer than that. It's sure. Oh, right. 10 to 15 years. 10 to 15 years. People don't know if they're going to still be living in their house. Like, yeah. Like, even homeowners are. I was hoping to avoid that point by using the four year example. <laughs> but you caught me. Yeah. Well, there could be better investments to make with that money. It better furnaces? No, just no, like outside, like outstanding or anything. I don't know. Yeah, that's it, right? And it seems obvious, but it's this, this isn't thought about in energy efficiency literature. We think about, we just have to communicate to people the short payback period or how much money they're going to save. What's, what's missing, Morgan? I was just going to say in four years, there might be better technology that's going to give you a better payback. Sure. Right? There might be better technology that gives me a better payback, or what else? Yeah. Oh, I was going to try and take a stab at the discount rate. <laughs> <laughs> keep thinking, keep thinking. We're going to get there. Yeah. Um, people might not be able to pay higher upfront costs. Well, I could get a loan for that, right? Let's presume an easy access to loans. It's crazy, right? Let's say I could get a loan for that, but people still don't do it. Why, why, why don't I take out a HELOC to get, a, to get the better furnace, the more efficient furnace? Fertile rates. Say again? Hurdle rates. Hurdle rates. Tell me why. Uh, you're like often in, say, real estate or something, they won't make an investment unless they can expect, say, 25% return. But uh, putting on a solar panel, while it gives you a 20% return, it's not quite enough. Yeah. So they say no. Why? Why won't they take anything but a 25% return? Uh, oftentimes, they're beholden to stakeholders. Yeah. Yeah. So I had this happen um, when I was working with uh, EPA. We were trying to get a, uh, uh, an entity that had uh, done some very bad things and was uh, part of a consent decree negotiation. This was during the Bush years. So we didn't, we didn't prosecute environmental polluters during the Bush years. We made consent decrees, which are like, we'll let you off the hook if you engage in a, um, a supplementary environmental program that improves your operations going forward, kind of a pro- pro-market, pro-business approach to regulation. 
And um, what we wanted them to do was to install these flanges that would recapture natural gas as it was being um, as it was being used to pressurize the lines, right? Because normally you pressurize the gas line to move the gas, and then it just gets vented to the atmosphere, right? You use some of that natural gas, and then once it's done um, running your your pressurization cycle, you just let it go, and it's a methane emission. And so the object was to put on either flares or these recaptured pneumatic technologies that would recapture that and put it back into the, into the stream. And uh, what the representatives from the company told us in the negotiation was, you don't understand. I know this stuff has a six-year payback. I don't care because I can put this same money into a new well that has a three-year payback. And there's no reason we would do that. Right? And so we went in with the assumption that we were giving these guys a great deal, but actually they were losing four years. Right? And we didn't realize that because we were approaching it from a limited perspective of the single technology. Right? And people make this decision all the time. Right? Why don't I buy the more efficient furnace? It's because I've got to send my kids to college. Right? I've got to buy a new car. I've got to pay insurance. I've got a surgery coming up. Right? There's all these other things that press on our ability to make decisions. Right? It's not like we have a pot of money that's just available for um, for energy investments, right? It competes with every other interest that we have, right? Including our vacations, right? The things that we hope keep us sane every now and then, hopefully, maybe. What are some other ones that we hit here? So we talked about revealed time preferences. We talked about opportunity costs. Ooh, net present value. All right, MBAs. Help us. What is net present value and why is it important? Oh, no, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. We're hoping that maybe through net present value, we'll get a better understanding, we'll get a better understanding, we'll get a better understanding of a discount rate. rate. See, we're, we, are, we, are, we are eschewing the linearity and objectivity presumption of our discussion, right? We might come at it better from another place. Yeah. So if, if you have uh, like $100 and you choose to invest it, you can establish a rate at which you might expect a return. And you can use the same rate to take future values. Let's say you take that $100 and put it into a wind plant, and it has expected revenue. Mm -hmm. You take those future revenues and discount it backwards at the same rate to find out what the current value of that money is and compare it to the initial investment of $100. Mm -hmm. If it's worth more than the current $100, it's a worthy investment. Otherwise, if it's not, then you should put your $100 in at 3% annual return and not spend money on wind farm. So it's a way of taking future revenues and bringing it to the present to compare it against the initial investment. It's pretty good. Pretty good thing. That's, that's well done. Yeah. Well done. Yeah. It's really hard. It takes some time, right? Yeah. Well, just to add on that, it's, you know, you can look at also like the rate of like, U.S. government treasury bonds, because that is what's considered the most like risk-free possible mm -hmm. investment. Mm -hmm. So therefore, if you have zero risk and you get that rate, then therefore you have to get a higher rate than that in order to take on any kind of risk. Right, because right. you could just, just be making that rate, rate with yeah. no risk at all. Exactly. So you <laughs> use that as your discount rate to see if you're going to make money you know, taking on that. Product. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think we have a good understanding of discount rates and net present value now. What does it have to do with climate change? Why are we talking about this? Ryan? Well, none of this really come, like, takes into account the cost of issues that are brought up by, by climate change. So the discount rate applied to climate change is saying, basically saying, it's like the all-in cost of a gallon of gasoline. So you might buy gas at four dollars a gallon, but the all-in social cost is closer to six to ten dollars because you're at that point you're mitigating future economic, future environmental issues. Is so it that the, the discount, discount rate as a concept can't conceptualize damage from climate? climate? So they choose not to. Do they choose not to? What's what's going on here, Malika? Um, it's that we disagree about how much we want to pay now to prevent the future environment. Yeah, that's it, right? What discount rate is appropriate? <laughs> I'm going to try to get better at writing with this same thing. Thor. But uh, doesn't the article like, uh, uh, tries to say that uh, you can't really use this discount rate on the climate change? Um, uh, 
to use in climate change because this discount rate is, is only like, an, uh, like a, a term you can use to figure out what is most benef beneficial for yourself. But with climate change, uh, like, uh, your choice will have uh, effects for other people. So therefore, like, it's only like a matter of like, ethics and like, uh, like what do you want to do for other people. Um, so this is a criti criticism raised not necessarily by the article, but by an article that's quoted in it. And that's on page six, right? Um, Weitzman is surely correct that prevailing interest rates reveal ethically relevant information, but it is information about how individuals acting as individuals and largely in their own interests weight present versus future well-being. However, the social discount rate should reflect explicitly moral other regarding judgments about the relative importance of well-being that exists far into the future. It is by no means clear that individual self-regarding behavior yields any insight whatsoever about what even those same individuals believe we owe to future generations. So there's a distinction here between a discount rate, which is kind of being set up within this argument as concerned with individual decision making, although we use discount rates for lots of other things, and saying we need something that's modified, right? We call it a social discount rate to deal with these 